Welcome and good evening to the City of Shakopee City Council meeting for April 3rd, 2018. Item number one, if we could call the roll, please. Councilor Luce. Here. Councilor Lehman. Here. Mayor Mars. Here. Council Whiting. Here. Councilor Mar Mokel. Here. Thank you. Let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three, approval of the agenda. Are there any changes, additions, deletions, Mr. Reynolds? Mr. Mayor, there is one change, and that is on memo 10A2. If you'll look at the discussion section, in the second sentence of that, it says as follows currently, it also limits these residential density to roughly 10% of the total land guided in two areas, Canterbury and Valley Fair. That has been changed at this point to say, to strike the word roughly and to insert or less after 10%, so the sentence will now read, it also limits these residential densities to 10% or less of the total land, uh, excuse me, total land guided in two areas, Canterbury and Valley Fair. All right. So noted on 10A2. Uh, Councilor Lehman? I would like to add an item to the agenda or other business, or an item that a resident specifically asked me to bring to Council. I don't know what number you want to make it. Um. Well, we could just uh, see other business. I do have his name, address, and phone number, and I can share that with staff. Why don't we do that uh, under reports right before the city bill list? Anything else? Seeing none, Councilor Whiting. I'll make a motion to uh, approve the agenda as amended. Second. I have a motion and a Second by Councilor Moko. Further discussion? 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Mm -hmm. Motion carries. Thank you. Item number four, consent agenda. Are there any additions, deletions, Mr. Reynolds? Nothing from staff, sir. Thank you. Councilor uh, Lehman? 4A5 to remove and 4D8. 4A5, 4D8. Seeing the oh, culture loose, I apologize. Um, four A five, four A six, four B one, and four C two. Four A five, four A six, four B one B. Hmm. Four B. Yeah. One. And then four C one, C two, C two. Okay. All right. So I'll just I'll read them here. Just I'll get a little more organized. Um. So I guess I have twice four A five to start with. Mike and Matt, and then 4A6, 4B1, 4C2, and 4D8. Okay. So six of them. I'll turn uh, five. Five of them. Five, Oop. sir. There are five, not six. Five what? There are five, not six. Unless I'm missing one. I've got five. Matt had wanted five A, four A five. Eight. And then Mike wanted the same one, but Mike added four A six, four B one, four C two, and four D eight. Is that? Which, which I did for a four D eight. Okay. I have one I have question, question on that that I didn't get to. Yeah. Um, are we good? 
Yes, sir. Okay. Make a motion to approve the consent <coughs> agenda as amended. Second. I have a motion and a second on the modified consent agenda. And before we vote, we will read the modified consent agenda into the record. Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. These are the consent agenda items for April 3rd of 2018. 4A1 approves the minutes of both the March, of the March 20th, 2018 meeting. 4A2 approves a general fund budget amendment allocating expenditures from the public works, fire and police departments to the building facilities fund. 4A3 approves general fund transfers of 500,000 to the city hall construction fund and 600,000 to the self-insurance internal fund. 4A4 adopts resolution number R2018-035, which approves a premise permit for the Shakopee Mat Club at the Shakopee Brew Hall, located at 124 First Avenue East. 4C1 adopts resolution number R2018-033, which sets a public hearing date to consider the vacation of a public rights of way and drainage and utility easement for Canterbury 6th edition. 4D1 approves the purchase of three John Deere 1570 mowers. 4D2 approves renewing a cleaning contract with Treasures Enterprise Incorporated. 4D3 accepts the low quote and authorizes execution of contract of a contract with American Environmental LLC for the 2018 Sanitary Sewer Televising Project. 4D4 approves subgrant program participation and funding for recycling through the Minnesota, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency Environmental Assistance Local Recycling Development Grant. 4D5 declares a 2002 Graco paint striper held by the Public Works Department as surplus property and authorizes its sale or disposal and authorizes the purchase of a replacement paint striper from Sherwin Williams in an amount not to exceed $12,988.11. 4D6 authorizes entering into a construction cooperative agreement with Scott County to install flashing yellow arrow operations on five traffic signals. 4D7 accepts a list of pre-approved pre professional engineering consulting firms for 2018, 2019, and 2020. And 4D9 adopts resolution number R2018-038, which approves the Minnesota Department of Transportation's delegated contracting process agreement. Thank you very much for the reading of the modified consent agenda. I have a motion and a second. There is no further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving ahead, now I'd like to call on any resident that would like to come forward and speak on an item not on the agenda. Not on the agenda, please come forward. State your name and address for the record and welcome. Anybody on an item not on the agenda? Seeing none, we will move forward then. <clears throat> Item number six, business removed from consent and we will start then with 4A5 and uh, Councilor Lamon. Mayor, it was quite the read. I'll have to be a minute here to find my highlighted areas. I, I have probably quite a bit in here actually, but how much time I'm gonna spend on it. While I was doing it, my highlighter died, so I ended up getting another one. That can't be good. What's that? That can't be good. <laughs> well, it was an old highlighter. It wasn't that much. The, uh, let's see, page 26. Uh, 6B, discipline including discharge. Um, my thought when I read this was, Council is directly involved in the hiring of department heads. And if there's gonna be a discharge of a department head, I think it should specify that department head specifically, council should be involved in that aspect. Um, not necessarily for rank and file. What page are you on, council? 26. It would be 26 6B. Yes, sir. And that and that is the case. This is just defining that uh, under the sexual harassment policy that that is one of the options that is available for uh, egregious cases. That, that doesn't change the fact that council has the responsibility under ordinance to be involved in either department heads, uh, patrol sergeants, and captains. I think his question though, uh, Mr. Reynolds, was on any possible discharge. Correct. Correct. Um, at that right. level. Right. Yeah, that, not necessarily f for that partic particular issue, but for any issue at a 
department head level. That's that's covered elsewhere. This is just referring to sexual harassment okay. as discharge okay. being one of the things that's. Councilor Whiting. Should this read up to and including discharge? Six B states that the city administrator may recommend A or B, which is discipline, including discharge. Um, I think that would default back to the discipline section in the personnel policy, which says discipline up to and including. And to clarify, yes, it does require council approval to discharge uh, or engage in any disciplinary action that includes a taking for department heads or captains. Okay, but Mayor, if I may, mm -hmm. other other places in the document in totality, it's basically saying that if the city administrator were to terminate a department head, the ra the ramifications for the department head is to uh, appeal to council specifically. And so that's <coughs> telling me with that line that that's not the case, that council's involved prior to that decision. The city administrator does not have the authority to terminate uh, department heads uh, uh, or police sergeants or uh, police captains. That by statute, by ordinance, is specifically the duty of city council. Well, that's good. Then we should make sure that this is consistent with our ordinance. Mr. Mayor and Councilor Lehman, if you look at 1085 disciplinary authority. Page, does, please. Um, that's going to be. All the way at the end. It's 10A5, that would be page 59 of 66. Disciplinary authority. It's the hiring authority for a position must approve of disciplinary action that results or may result in loss of wages such as suspension, demotion, or termination. That would override any other section. So the authority for disciplinary action that includes termination, suspension, demotion for department heads, captains, or sergeants would be at the council's discretion. All under the preview of the council. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And so this is the body of the previous body that Councilor Lehman was bringing up for sexual harassment. This is the general body for those department heads. Yes. Okay. And that is actually in our ordinance. Yes. yes. And that particular section of the policy wasn't actually a change, the one that you were referencing. Councilor okay. um, Lewis, did you have a question? No, I'm okay. not going to uh, I'm going to find my next spot here. Oh, we can't accept cars and boats and stuff. Darn. <laughs> Helicopter, helicopter. You're funny. <laughs> the snowmobile. Helicopters. Yes. I don't think I'd fly a helicopter today. The helicopter's been denied. <laughs> the other one was uh, page 29I, where it says the city administrator or city council may abolish a position um, and promote an employee into similar or more responsible position in the same or related department. Um, now, I know that the body, the council can do that. They can restructure or whatever. Um, that's basically a minor restructuring if we're going to abolish positions and move people around. Not against necessarily moving them around if it's possible. Um, but to do it outside of council, I guess, is what I'm having a little bit of concern with. We're kind of out of the loop, not knowing what's going on as far as the structure of the organization at that point. That wasn't changed, was Yeah, that, wasn't, that, that language that. wasn't altered. That, yeah. That's the same language that's in our current employee handbook. Okay, can we make it better? That, that's certainly. That's council can council do whatever they want, wish to in regards okay. to that. I think that, uh, Mr. Mayor and Councilor Layman, if I might, the, the intention of this is less so for to give the administrator or any other, any administrative authority to move people around exactly, and more to 
make it possible in an instance where the council creates a new position that we can, instead of posting that mm -hmm. position, yep. the intention can be in to move the person in that's already in kind of an existing position into a new one. Right, and all I'm asking is for the transparency piece that council is in the know of what's going on, and this doesn't say that. It says that the administration can do it without council. It's basically. That's not exactly what it's saying. It's well, that's saying, how I'm reading it. It's <coughs> saying that the procedures don't necessarily have to be followed but by doing this. And you have to look at handbooks as not all encompassing, but that is just snippets of information for employees to know. As far as ordinances, we'd still have to follow those. Okay, so what's that doesn't necessarily have to be in your what handbook. What does the ordinance say on this? Because if you put too much information into a handbook and you change something, then you have to change the entire handbook. And for, so that's for why. For the ordinance. Right. That's why I'm saying you want very vague language in your handbook, not specific, because you okay. have your ordinances that cover that. Okay. And, and the, the majority of the work that was done on, on this particular document was to bring us into um, federal law and also uh, uh, best practices as uh, recommended by the League of Minnesota Cities. So uh, this handbook hadn't been looked at in quite some time and so the majority of the information um, that was changed was specifically because of those issues. <laughs> Mayor if, if you think you make me feel comfortable by saying federal government or League of Minnesota cities, it makes me more uncomfortable. <laughs> well, we have to follow the law. I know. I'm, I know. <laughs> Just to follow up with that, I think in this particular instance, a good example would be last summer we changed a IT position from yeah. a grade five position to a grade six. The council did that, right? <laughs> you eliminated the one position and created the second, mm -hmm. and then pursuant to normal practices, we promoted the person who was in that grade five position to the grade six. six. And that's the intention of this, is just to cover right. primarily that type of scenario in this section. Okay. And let's see if I got, I think I have one more here. Um, and I, you know, this is for the HR people in the world, which was many years ago for me, and probably not as much as some of others, <coughs> Kathy. but. <laughs> In corporate America, they have specific disciplinary actions. You know, guidelines. You don't show up for work mm -hmm. three times. It's this, the first offense, this, the second offense. It's mm -hmm. t -t 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 -t. that's really easy to to say. This is what the guidelines are. We ha we don't have any of that. It's just kind of like it could be this, could be that, might be that, up to this. Have we thought about having something structured? Our contracts all have something that is more structured based on the negotiations we completed last year. It is a best practice to follow verbal, written, oral, standards, suspension, demotion, termination, and so that is the practice that we do follow. Okay. I don't think you have to outline that in specifics in our handbook because as Councilor Moko said, it's, it's not an all-encompassing document, but we do follow best practices in the guidelines. And and to, to, as far as corporate America, you don't want to sit, sit yourself in that position, speaking for where I work, is because what can happen is if you have somebody steal from you, then you're stuck in that progressive discipline where it, it's, you really just want to get rid of them at that point. So you have to be careful about how you work, put too much out there. There are going to be expectations from employees. And so that's why you want to be as vague as possible. I can realize that all situations are a little different, and some might be an oversight and not necessarily warrant any kind of discipline other than maybe some education mm -hmm. for the first time, you know. If you, Mr. Mayor and Council Lame, if you look at page 60, we do actually have the phrase. 62? 60. We do have progressive discipline outlined there, and it kind of shows we go oral reprimand, written reprimand, suspension, or other disciplinary action up to and including, and then finally discharge uh, as a discipline. And you know, I, th I would follow along with Councilor Mokel's co comments. Um, you know, when I was a county administrator, <laughs> I had an employee who over a course of time as a pattern was stealing gravel from the county and using the county's equipment to put it down on his own private driveway. And he said, well, you don't have a policy against taking gravel. I didn't know I couldn't do it. Um, so sometimes writing policies that are so tight give people the impression that if it's not written down as something you're not allowed to do. Right. They can feel like they go ahead and do it. 
Um, and because we un ended up with personnel policies that kind of allowed us to skip over oral and written because of the fact that what he was doing was fairly egregious. You know, and when somebody's doing that kind of thing and that kind of pattern, you don't want to keep them in, their, in your employ. So that's where this goes. I had you have just one more. Okay. The last one. No, I'm gonna, yep, no, go ahead, Matt. And then. The last one I have was under the military uh, leave, um, Federal Military Leave Act, I think it's yeah. called. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'll use an example. Let's say our finance director is out <coughs> for 26 weeks on that, on that program. Do we have the ability to temporarily put somebody in that position while they're gone, but you recognize that when they come back, they're back in their position? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, the answer is yes, you okay. do. All right. Absolutely. Just to clarify, the military leave portion of this is state law, I believe. It is state. Okay. We have to follow that at minimum, yep. but certainly if the council chose, you can extend greater benefit. Yeah. Well, and it could be it could be the HR director is out for that program. I mean, you got to have these things in the organization. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. It's a, probably a little different in like police or fire where your next captain could fill in or something because they know the whole structure where these pieces are all specialized in mm -hmm. areas. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Lewis? Is it going back to the theft issue, wouldn't it be a good idea to put one line in here, theft is an automatic, you're gone? Is that a pen Mr. or Mr. Mayor and Councilor Lewis, I would, su I would suggest that that creates that situation where an employee has a reasonable expectation that you're identifying everything that they could do wrong. And we, we need to keep it wider as opposed to narrow. So I would suggest against that. I think on some of these uh, discipline, I like the verticalness of what I see in the discipline deal. In corporate America, they have different areas where if a, uh, employee is absent for a little bit and then you, you're in trouble there, but then they do something else and they can't tie them together. They're all separate and this has to go up this channel and this another and you're going, and, and you know, some have a deal where if you have like three of these going at one time, you can connect the dots. Right. But there's a lot of time missed in that it could go on for six months and you're on corrective action for this corrective action for that, but you're going, oh, and then how do you move forward and move on from that employee? And I like what I saw here was just more straight vertical. And uh, I think there's enough uh, language, at least in the handbook, and then back by ordinance to take action where necessary. Um, other questions on this? I asked several questions on this about um, that we saw in an email. Um, this handbook has not been updated in a long time, so. Mr. Mayor, since 2014. Yep, takes a lot of time. Councilor Luce? Page 16, uh, there's a line in here that says, must be turned, I believe you wanted to state, must be returned, it's equipment that they have uh, to use in their job. What paragraph are you on here? Which section would be are uh, J1, second from the bottom of J1. In J1, mm -hmm. you think that's a typo? I should say return. Mm -hmm. Okay. J1. Yep. Yep. It should Agreed. say return. Yep. Oh, just, just highlighting a typo, just so you yep. can take care of it. Um, going back to page 11 on B1. Uh, it says every employee shall be ready to begin actual operations at the employee's place of work at a specific starting time. Uh, we do have a department uh, within our city that allows breakfast to be eaten on city time. Um, this is stating that nobody's supposed to be doing that. That is incorrect. What is incorrect? Your, your comment is incorrect, Councilor Luce. We've been through this multiple times. multiple times in the last couple of years. I witnessed it. This is years old. They're, they're ready, they're on the job. No. They're, all right, all right. 
Page 15. G. Um, we do have a problem with some people smoking in city vehicles. I think we need to. Uh, this is years, again, this this is is years old. That, that has been dealt with the, at least six months ago, <coughs> Councillor Luce. At least six months ago. Let's talk about what's knowledge. in the handbook that needs to be changed and not what somebody is violating. Well, I think a line should be put in there about smoking. It's in there. It's under G. Yeah, but it should. The vehicle should be checked when they go into the shop for work. If someone notices that something should be done. Next. Okay. Councilor Whiting. I looked. I, I tried to find something wrong with this, and uh, I, I wish I would have caught a typo or something like Councilor Luce did. But, um, <laughs> I, th I thought you, uh, you know, it, it was it was a lot of it was already put in here, and the changes you made. I went back and forth, and I appreciate the way you've set this up, so I could tra try and figure out where the changes were made. Oh, thank you for that, because uh, I was looking for them. And uh, a lot of times you do the red line copy, but but that that worked for me, so I appreciate that. So um, I will make a motion to approve the personnel handbook revisions as proposed in the attached memo and handbook draft. No question. Second. Now second. And I, I also a, would like to say that having written many of these, thank you guys for going through this. I have a motion and a second on the table. Don't you lose. Um, the fire department and the police department, I didn't notice anything in here when they come in contact with infectious diseases from bodily fluids, uh, any testing. Um, that would be in a bloodborne pathogen policy that they have. They have standard, sorry, Mr. Mayor, council members, they do have their own standard operating procedures. They handle bloodborne pathogens. They have training constantly right, on how just, to handle. But they, their that's records. an automatic testing for them. They are trained on it. They know how to handle it. They know how to report it. It is part of their safety mechanism. Another handbook. Yep. <laughs> it is not, not a handbook. Yep. It is a whole different can of worms. <laughs> right. And I just was questioning whether or not that you know should have been in here. But if they have a separate handbook for that, oh. that's fine. I just want to make sure that it's. Mm -hmm. included in there because I have witnessed that and um, it's something that should be dealt with. You know, it should be an automatic form if they come in contact. Um, in here it states about uh, police department captains and sergeants and such. Uh, there was nothing mentioned in here about uh, fire department captains specifically. Um, in regards to what? It would be on page 27A, second paragraph, last line. If I, if I may, Mr. Mayor and Councilor Luce, the reference to the captains and the sergeants in the police department is because they are different by ordinance. Um, we did not see a reason to create a different class of employee in the fire department. This, <clears throat> Mayor, if I can. Councilor Leland. The sentence before that is talking specifically about uh, the city administrator must recommend and the city council must approve the hire of department heads slash police captains, police sergeants, new hires, where the wage or salary is b above the midpoint of the compensation schedule for the position. Mm -hmm. So that's been policy. When I was talking about um, hiring department heads or terminating department heads, that council would be involved in that. And apparently that's ordinance, so. Yeah. That's yeah. consistent with um, the sergeants, captains, chief as a department head, so that's cons consistent too. The, the, uh, the front line employees, whether it's a street worker or a patrol officer or firefighter, they're usually hired through the selection process of you know, an interview committee and that department head or designee or whatever. <clears throat> so, you know, we're not gonna, I'm certainly not gonna put the si t time aside to go through, you know, 300 and some frontline employees, right. no. you know. Um, but the department head level and, mm -hmm. and stuff, you know, your chief of police, captain, sergeants, whatever, are, are the ones that we need to make sure are the, the leaders for the organization in that area. We've been doing that. Correct. Yeah. Um, okay, Councilor Luce. 
Page 31D, employees normally shall be paid bi-weekly. Shouldn't that be bi-monthly? No, it's bi-weekly pay. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, council members, it is bi-weekly payroll. That's Every two weeks, right? That is, and that's not a change. That's how we currently pay our okay, employees. Okay, I just questioned the way it was worded. Um, and then um, there's a question here. We have a, a, I believe it's a director that's part of the fire department. And in here it states that fire department shall be paid one and a half times regular rate. Anybody that is a regular employee who answers a fire call mm -hmm. will automatically get time and a half. Is that for a salaried person? So, sorry, Mr. Mayor, council members, a full-time employee who answers a fire call during regular business hours is paid their hourly wage. That's in the next paragraph down. Yep. Mr. Mayor, Councilor, here again. This isn't a change. This no, I'm not looking at a change. Exactly that's that's, okay. that's been a standard for in our city for a while. For a long time, actually. I'll call the question. Uh, motion on the table. Second. A second. Call the question. There was no second to call the question. I seconded. Oh, you did? Okay. Uh, uh, motion on the table to call the question with a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. I'm opposed to the call of the question because I think this is an important enough document that everybody that here needs to understand it. And if somebody has questions and they can be clarified, there's no harm in that. And I'll return the favor. Roberts, rolls of order. It's not debatable. Go back to the main motion. There is a second and uh, a motion and a second on the table. Uh, no further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion carries four to one. Four to one, yep. Is, is that right? Yep. I, okay, I want to make sure I heard that right. All right, thank you. Moving ahead then to 4A6, which is the recruitment uh, stipends, and I believe Councilor Luce had this one up. Yeah, the question I had is, wouldn't we be better off to pay the stipend to the new hire than we do it to the person that's already working for us? <laughs> or are we Mr. just Mayor ending up with Lewis. a conflict with hiring with other cities? We, we gave a, we've been talking about this for a long time, and we gave a lot of consideration to trying this. We didn't want to bring it forward. We think it's unique and different. Um, but we think that the employees that are referred to us by other staff that are existing staff are our best employees. Um, and frankly, we felt as though this got our staff out there doing our marketing for us. That's, this is less about compensating the new staff or compensating the employee who's referring them mm -hmm. and more about incentivizing them to market for us. Mm -hmm. So that's why we did it this way. And this is the test for three months. Good question. More, more, do you have more questions? No, I just was wondering what the yep. thought pattern was. Councilor uh, Lehman. Mayor, my, my comments on this is uh, GE uses this under their Six Sigma uh, process, and it's pretty successful, actually. Okay. And uh, in order, even if you wanted to give the bonus to the person you hire, you got to get them here first in order to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and this is the process of trying to get them here to begin with. And he, you have to get him here, plus he has to perform for 100 hours. Right, on a, right. I had a little problem because in, in the company I work for, it's, it's 90 days before that payout. And then I'm looking at the hours going, oh, but this is a part-time position. So mm -hmm. I looked at that and went, mm -hmm. okay. Um, and by that time, you're going to determine if a, an employee likes it enough or is doing well. So anything to <coughs> help. Um, where we need it here. Council Moko? And studies have shown that people, when you recruit within from people that know other people, they tend to stay longer in your, in your employee than people when you just market outside, so. Right. So maybe we should use this moment as a <laughs> idea to, we're hiring lifeguards, huh? Is that, so Mr. Mayor how, Council, we are hiring lifeguards. How old do you have to be to be a lifeguard? Well, you have, 15. You have to be 15. 15 but, years old, so yep. people watching at home have grandkids or kids and they, you, you can work for the city and it's part time and you have to be certified certified in, in as a lifeguard or, yep. and mm -hmm. we're willing to certify so you're willing to pay for that training mm -hmm. yep. wow so kids can actually 
have fun and work at the yeah. same time. And We've had a practice that's been longstanding where if you, if you are trained by us and you come work for us for a certain period of time, then we will waive or ref refund your fees for okay. lifeguard certification. Cool. Uh, Councilor Luce? I would suggest that we contact the high school and the swim team. They're all very good swimmers, and I think if they knew that they could get certified through the city, they would probably be interested. Mr. Mayor and Council Luce, I would tell you that about 70% of the swim team is already a lifeguard yep. for us. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have some swim clubs, too. We so, used to have the Barracuda Club and uh, um, there's some swim schools yep. and Savage and things, too, so yeah, some opportunity. Some, but. We're going to grab some other high school swim teams. Yeah. That's our hope. More questions on this? You want this one? Councilor Lehman. Make a motion to approve the uh, policy action as required relating to the stipend payable for part-time uh, part lifeguard recruitment. Okay. I, I have a motion and a second by Councilor Whiting. Were there discussion? 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Now we will move forward to uh, 4B1, and 4B1 is solicitation of bids for our fire station. Uh, Councilor uh, Luce. Yeah, I went up and uh, looked at these windows, and I, I know we were just going for bids. I just can't believe that anybody ever put those windows in a, in a public building. I mean, that's ridiculous. And uh, one other thing here back uh, in the project manual, They've got it marked as station two. I believe that's in error, so. Mr. Mayor and Council Lewis, I would, yeah, it's, it's fire station one. Correct. That has, it has wood windows and they're, those especially are, on the south side, starting to rot out. Those are original windows to the structure, so. That's correct. Um, better windows. That building's what, 20 some years old? Yeah. Is it that old already? Hmm. I think that referendum is done, isn't it? 96. 96, Council Lewis. They're further than rotting out. They're ready to fall out. If you want. And I think back then the day was wood windows and now the technology has improved and over the years. So, um, yeah. other questions, Councilor Luce? Um, when this comes back to us uh, with, the, with the beds, could we hopefully get some samples of what the material is going to be that they're going to replace them with? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Councilor Luce, it's specced as pretty much the exact same material as is in this building. So, aluminum frame. What you see in the aluminum frame yeah, is right out here. That was my hope. I just yeah. wanted to yeah. make sure that. Yeah. I think the specs call for aluminum. The specs call for. Right. We can't specify exactly brand. No. Um, but it's supposed to be the same stuff, uh, the same material. Councilor Lehman. Mayor, I saw the price tag estimate on this, and I almost fell down. 160 some thousand dollars for some windows I'm like okay in the wrong business. why is this so expensive and when you go out and look there's a lot of windows yeah <laughs> you know and they're they're not all average you know 30 30 some inches by 40 some inches they're all different sizes and big ones and small ones and stuff so I think uh, let's, I, hope, uh, let's hope the bids come back favorable better than the, <clears throat> you know you're right I think though that you know I think our CIP is uh, generally very for the most part pretty accurate um, recently we've had some things that have, haven't been updated uh, for a while there and um, and then we look and it looks out of place um, but it looks like we're changing consultants so um, I think that is good in the end even hope that the price comes it's not the CIP it's the building fund which does roofs and building major internal service and fund stuff. is what it's called I make a motion to approve the solicitation of bids for Fire Station 1 window project. Second. I have a motion and a second on the table. Further discussion? Discussion? Discussion all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Let's move forward to 4C2. And 4C2 is set a public hearing to transfer the property from the old eight shock VHRA to the EDA and Councilor Luce? I just uh, want to all, of, if we figure out what all the property is, I would like to have it listed when it comes back to us. Uh, of the properties? Right, what we're going to be transferring. Because right now, like, according to what I see here, we're totally unsure. We are unsure of how many properties we have. 
staff? Mayor and Council, currently we have found two properties. The um, parcel that's behind Doggy Doos is currently in the HRA, and there was an EDA before the current EDA that was after the HRA that has some interest in the um, River City Center. So we're trying to clean this up. It was found through the um, city attorney's research that when the second EDA was formed, the power from the HRA, these properties were not transferred over to them. So we actually have to hold a public hearing and amend the current EDA charter to absorb the properties that would be in the HRA's name. So when we get to that, we'll have a list of those properties. Okay. Uh, Councilor Lehman. Mayor, we, uh, I was here when we did the refinancing of the Block three and four River City Center, and that was through our current EDA. So, this might be titled. Though. So, Mayor and Council will be having some title work done, but however, the underlying ground lease may be with the HRA on that particular property. We only have one property for sure that's in full title to the HRA, and that's the piece behind Doggy Dudes. Yeah, I think the city actually owns the property under that building, if mm -hmm. I remember right. Under River I think City. Correct, yeah. Yeah. Um, Councilor Whiting. We'll make a motion to set a public hearing for May 1st, 2018 to allow the transfer of property of the HRA to the EDA. Second. I have a motion and a second. Further discussion? 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Moving ahead then to 4D8, uh, Professional Service Agreement, and Councilor Lehman. Mayor, I'll make a motion to execute the professional services agreement with Advanced Engineering and Environmental Services, Inc. for the Sanitary Sewer Master Plan update, and then I'll speak to it if there's a second. Second. I have a motion and a second to a question. Just a simple question that I didn't get a chance to ask the engineer about or the administrator. Um, when we hired uh, MKSK to do our comprehensive plan update, I assume that the comp plan update would include transportation component a sewer component and when I saw this come forward separately I'm wondering are we paying two to do the same thing Steve uh, mayor and council members um, no we're not paying two to do the same thing um, MKSK is doing the higher level visioning goal part of the entire comprehensive plan including the sanitary and stormwater part um, before you tonight is a sanitary um, portion of the master plan but we also hired um, WSB to do our, the detailed, more in-depth storm sewer component of the comprehensive plan update. Um, higher level with a lot more detailed and technical components to it with modeling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now in front of you tonight is um, basically mimics the same thing for the stormwater. This is for the sanitary sewer. Um, again, more detailed. Um, technical components to it for example um, the annexation of uh, township areas we need to do detailed planning to make sure that we are planning appropriately for the right size sanitary sewer piping lift stations integration with met council um, treatment plants um, and that's what that takes a lot more coordination and that was not part of the scope for mksk okay all right um, okay uh, motion on the table and a second further discussion 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 all in favor say aye 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 those opposed motion passes thank you very much um done with consent business removed from consent moving forward public hearing 7a for 2018 currency exchange license culture whiting make a motion to open a public hearing second i have a motion and a second to open the public hearing further discussion discussion all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, public hearing is now open. Lori. Hi, Mayor and Council. Um, we're here tonight to um, hold a public hearing for approval of a currency exchange license. Um, this license is provided by the state, but we, by uh, current law, are required to hold a public hearing um, for this. Um, XL Pond Incorporated, um, it's basically a renewal of the current currency exchange license, um, and that's about it. Yeah. Um, the police department has commented in this regard as well on this application. Other uh, questions of staff? Questions of staff? Councilor uh, Luce? I don't have a question of staff. I just would like to thank the 
member of the XL Pond staff for showing up and at least showing some, uh, I don't even know what you want to call it, but at least being present here because <laughs> yes. most of the people don't even pay the waste their time, I guess. Yep. I thought he was here to complain about it. I was <laughs> here. Councillor Lehman. Question for staff, what's the length of the license? It's a year license. One year? Yeah, it's a one-year license. Um, depending on, I know that the reason it's later, usually we get these renewals at the end of the year, um, but um, XL, uh, Pond and, um, yeah, XL Pond and Jewelry had a change in um, ownership, ownership. Yeah. so the, the business name changed, and so they had to go through the whole entire process. So it took a little bit longer this year for their renewal, but um, there's not been any issues or anything. Okay. So. Councilor Lewis? Well, uh, as to Councilor Whiting's comment, um, I think the rep a representative of anyone, any group coming before this body, there should be a representative here for anything. If they don't put a rep send a representative, we shouldn't even bother doing what they want us to do. We've seen that in the past, and some folks feel it's routine, some don't. Um, it is routine. I mean, it's huh? kind of routine, but it's, kind of routine. But it, it's, it's good to see someone come. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Other questions of staff? If not, thank you. Uh, would the applicant and or their representatives like to make f come forward and make a comment in regard to uh, this application? It's routine. <laughs> <laughs> Please state your name and address for the record and welcome. Sam Rockney. I'm the manager at XL Pond Incorporated. So I don't live in town. I live in Northfield. So thanks for but, being here uh, tonight. We had an issue one year. We had a person suing us that came Thank before you. the hearing and, and made a stink. They lost their lawsuit, but you know they did throw a fit, and I didn't happen to be here that year, so I plan to be here from now on, <laughs> just in case anybody has any questions. <laughs> Thank you questions for, for Lewis. hearing us. Just appreciate you showing up here. Yeah, that thanks, Mike. shows respect. Yep. Um, if there's no other questions, thank you. This is a public hearing. Would anybody else like to step forward and make comment? In regard to this application, please come forward. This is a public hearing. Seeing none, Councilor Lehman. Make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. I have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Uh, discussion, discussion, discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, public hearing is now closed. Uh, Councilor Lehman. Offer resolution R2018-034, resolution approving the application of XL Pond Inc. DBA, XL Pond and Jury. 450 West First Avenue and currency exchange license. I have a motion and a okay. second by Councilor Moko. Uh, further discussion? 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Moving ahead, I, uh, item eight. Well, now we will stand in recess <coughs> for our uh, economic development meeting. We we'll stand in recess. Call the shock BDA to order April 3rd, 2018. Secretary, please note the roll. Everybody should have an agenda and a consent uh, business in front of you. Any questions on the agenda, Mr. Mars? I'll offer a motion to approve the agenda as stated. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Smoke goal. Any discussion on the agenda? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion passes. Consent agenda includes the EDA bill list and minutes. Item 3C, um, is that on consent also? Yes. Yep. Professional service agreement with SRF Consulting Group, Canterbury Commons Traffic Study. Small, uh, Mr. Whiting. Make a motion to approve the consent business. Second. Motion by Mr. Whiting, seconded by Ms. Mokul. Questions, Mr. Luce. Yeah, I just had a question on the bill list. Um, $8,249 for signs. Um, that's a lot of money for signs. And uh, I know that Public Works has their own sign shop. I'm just curious, do they have the personnel to handle some of this and cut our costs here, or? Well, we know it's a downtown 101 corridor project sign. I'm, I'm gonna guess for that kind of money, it's got something to do with the entrance monument signs, but let's ask, Mr. Kersky. 
Mr. President, board members, that was for um, a partial payment for either the downtown sign or the digital board. That was about a $50,000 or $60,000 sign package. And I think that was the last payment for the install. Mr. Lewis. All the signs that we see along Canterbury's projected pro project, who, uh, is that paid for by the developer or does the city have something to do with that? Mr. President, Council Member, uh, Member Luce, those are part of our transparency program. So actually we buy the signs up front and then we charge back to the developer both a portion cost of the sign, they install and deinstall. So depending on the size of the project, it runs four to $800 to the applicant. Mr. Isles? But the, the signs that basically are advertising Canterbury Commons are on Canterbury Commons. Mr. Reynolds, I think Councilmember Luce is talking about the city signs that you see at. Those city signs are our signs. Yes, signs. those are our signs, and they're at DR Horton for any time there's an application that appears before the Planning Commission where there's going to be a public hearing, there are four by eight signs placed at least one, if not two or three locations, depending on how busy the location is. And those are paid for by um, the applicant. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about different signs first. <laughs> first, you've got the sign saying this is, could be the future site of something. Public hearing is on this date. That's, the, that's one sign. Then you have the downtown monument sign that says, Welcome to Historic Shockby, or whatever it says on uh, Somerville, is it? There, there are, uh, Mr. Chairman, the President, though, there are signs downtown. One says downtown, one says Shakopee. Those are part of the downtown improvements. There's a digital sign. Yep. There's also downtown that says Shakopee Anna that has city events on it. That has also been paid for out of the right. downtown improvement program. And then you have, you know, speed limit and do not park here and blah, blah, Those blah. are done by the city, shine, Our city sign shop. traffic signs. Mr. Myers. I have stuck two comments on Councilor Lusa. You know, the sign here that for the 8200, that is for the downtown corridor, came out of the EDA out of our downtown improvement project. But I do want to make a comment about our signs that are for rezoning and stuff. Our community has talked about having those signs for over 20 years and uh, nothing has ever happened and I've, I've seen those signs around town and uh, I commend staff. I think it brings visibility, uh, transparency, m more awareness to have people that drive by. I, I think they're great because I've seen them in, in other communities and it it's really, I think, when you see a change in something, and that's important, so I appreciate that. I'm going to take the opportunity here as president to say if we're going to have any more discussion about the bill list, yes. I'm going to, we're going to take it off consent. Is there any? I withdraw. So we have, do we have a motion for consent business? Second. We have a motion to And consent. a second. All in favor of the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Public hearing, 4A. Mr. Mars. Mr. President, I'll offer a motion to open the public hearing. A second. Motion by Mr. Mars, second by Ms. Moko. Open a public hearing. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Public hearing is open. Mr. Kirsky, you're on. Mr. President, board members, this is a statutory requirement. You approved the purchase agreement for these two properties at your last board meeting. This is just a public notice. Two ads were placed in the Shakopee Valley News, notifying the public they would be hearing tonight. Um, once that's done, we can begin actual the transaction to close on those properties. So, Mr. Kersky, for the benefit of the public audience, these are two properties, Doggy Doos, uh, the small strip along 69 was 50,000 or something like that. $50,000 and there's a piece going to was formerly Topaz Investments, they've assigned it to RT, Shack RTC, I think one or two. That is the um, facility that's going behind Doggy Doos. And that's and that potentially three buildings that we built over the next several years. And that purchase price hasn't changed in like, like 375 or something? Correct, sir. Okay. Any questions of staff? This is a public hearing. Is anybody who wishes to step forward and speak on this topic? No, don't stampede. <laughs> it's going to be a long night there out the door. So, public hearing, anybody that wants to speak on a topic? Mr. Mars. Mr. President, I'll offer a motion to close the public hearing. <coughs> motion. Mr. Mars, seconded by Mr. Luce. 
Motion to close the public hearing. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. What's the wishes of the body? Mr. Whiting. Make a motion to, uh, we'll take the first resolution, uh, approve the resolution number E2018-008 for Doggy Doo Spa and Retreat Incorporated. Is there a second on motion? Moco? Whiting or Moco? Any discussion on the motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Mr. Whiting? Oh, Ms. Moko, sorry. I make a motion um, to approve resolution number E2018 009 for Shock RTC LLC, formerly Topaz Investments. There's a motion by Ms. Moko and seconded by Mr. Mars. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion passes 5-0. Any other business before this body? Mr. President, I just thought we'd introduce uh, Jen Brington, who's your new economic development specialist. 75% um, of her time is spent on working on EDA matters. So Jen will just come up for a second. Um, she's been here seven days and <laughs> getting, in, getting into the groove. Introduce yourself. Yeah, Jen Brington, excited to be here. Um, it's already got me working on projects, so it's good. Um, the next couple weeks, hopefully I'll be out and about, kind of getting my face out to the public, um, doing some events with the planning department, just to kind of see what's going on in the community um, and really focus on the downtown area and getting things moving. So I'm excited to be here. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Mr. Whiting. You wanna tell us a little bit about your background? I mean, you don't sure. have to, but. <laughs> um, most of my background, I've worked with regional organizations, so I've worked at more of a 100 foot level working with um, communities to get businesses into their community recruitment um, expansion efforts is really my main focus, um, which I think will be an asset to this community. Um, also, I'm a big fan of housing and transportation initiatives, so I think with my background and knowledge, I'll be a good fit here. Great, welcome. Yeah, thank you. No other business, a motion to adjourn would be in order, Mr. Mars. Mr. President, I'll offer a motion to adjourn the Shockby EDA Authority till May 1st, 2018 at 7 p.m. <coughs> Second by Mr. Luce. All in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Motion passes. We are adjourned. Let's reconvene this uh, um, April 3rd, 2018 Sh City of Shockby City Council meeting. Uh, completed our work in our EDA. Now we're gonna move ahead to 10A1, uh, ordinance to amend the landscaping code screening and tree preservation. Mr. Kursky, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, <coughs> thought we'd just revisit um, the workshop from back in November and talk about the changes we've made in the landscape code. You've got a red line version and a clean version to look at. So we were not able to reduce a lot of the words, but we tried to make um, the code a little easier. So you can see one of the issues was, it was hard to define a lot of the different landscaping materials that were in the code. So the biggest change from a tree replacement standpoint is we've eliminated counting the species that we talked about that were diseased, like the ash trees or nuisance trees, like buckthorn, willow, fruit trees, cottonwood, and box elder. So Currently, right now, you are assessed if those are cut down, even though we all know that they're not trees you necessarily want to preserve, but the current code has that. We've eliminated that. Um, you're still allowed to clear 60% of the trees, and we change the replacement values, so you get a eight credit, for instance, if you save a high priority tree versus before it was one um, versus two inches. So that's a pretty big change in the code right there. Um, <clears throat> So here's a good example. Um, if you save a 20-inch oak tree, there's eight trees you don't have to plant. So it's basically, it's a credit against your landscaping requirement. Um, you still would have to pay for unauthorized removals if you can't meet the minimum requirements on site. So the landscaping requirements, um, again, street trees would be required in urban sections, one per 40 lineal foot of um, frontage. It would change the landscaping requirements to total square footage of the footprint. So that's a, a, a huge change. So right now, if you're doing a four-story apartment building, all the total square footage times the floor 
gets multiplied out. So let's just say it was a 100,000 square foot building, four stories tall, you would have to do landscaping that would be the equivalent of a 400,000 square foot building. On a lot of sites, that's almost impossible. So what we've done is change the code so it's only the first floor footprint, period. Um, that is significant. Yeah, that's a big deal. That's, Mayor, that's a huge change. And, right. and what the reason why that was designed originally was to provide buffers so that if you had an apartment building next to a single family, a lot of that extra landscaping theoretically would go into a buffer area. We've actually incorporated a new kind of table where you can choose what buffer you want to do so that if you're a resident, single family residential next to an apartment building or commercial next to a single family neighborhood, you'll know by looking at the diagram what can be done and what's required for the buffer. So it's no longer kind of catch as catch can, it's which is kind of the way it's been. It's been negotiated project by project. Now there's actually a standard that you have to follow to provide that buffer. Um, right now, and, that, and that's the requirement for the buffer landscaping between residential and commercial apartments or industrial. So if you're residential between any of those three uses, you have to provide some sort of buffer, and we've given you everything from a wall to landscaping. A couple different choices, I saw that, right? Correct, Mayor. Right. Along with a nice okay. diagram to, I mean, really spell it out <laughs> for you, too, so it, uh, it helps. So you can think about what you have for space and what you have need for a buffer. And Mayor and Council, that's the other big change. We put a lot more photographs and diagrams into the code because there was a lot of people that just didn't understand it was fairly complicated. You know, so give us a picture. So we tried to find examples of other places or had examples done so that we can actually explain the code to people through pictures. And we've also added tables and eliminated a lot of the text. Um, parking lot trees have gone from square footage of pavement to one tree per 10 spaces, and I have an example, I'll show you how that's calculated out. Uh, requires foundation plantings and change required trees from um, inch and a quarter to two inch. So this is, we showed you this example um, back in November. This uh, on your left is kind of the way it's calculated right now. On the right was an actual example of kind of what we were headed towards. So to assist in some of the first wash of stormwater and other things to make the landscaping similar that we've done at City Hall and downtown to make it a more porous area so some of that rainwater can go into it. If you look at the actual calculation, um, the drawing on the right is what the new code would require if you were gonna do trees. So under the old code, which was 4,000 square feet per, one tree per 4,000 square feet of pavement, that included all the dry vials in that area. So under the old code, you would have had to do 12 trees in this parking lot. Under the new code, the maximum you'd have to do is nine, so it actually has reduced the number of trees required by three in this example. So we've already been talking to other developers that work in other cities. They all understand this because most of the cities require this. If you go to any of the shopping centers in the surrounding cities, you'll notice there's tree islands in the parking lot, and that's because they have a very similar code to this. So we were actually able to take some of the code language from other cities around here and just incorporate into our code. So you'll be seeing a couple of projects moving forward when we talk to the developer about this is a possibility. They were like, we do this all around the Twin Cities. It's not any big news to us. And so actually they understand it. It lessens the number of trees required for a standard parking lot. So to go back to the sand company example, we talked about this last time, but here's really the bottom line. So on this particular project, and again, these are our estimates, Currently, under the old code, they would owe $329,600. Under the new code, it's $158,400. So it's a pretty big drop because we're cutting out, we're changing the way we're measuring the trees, and we're also changing to get rid of all the ash trees and all those other species that were in the code. Those are all out now. So there was some concern at the Planning Commission by one commissioner in particular that we were going to be losing a lot of canopy in the city. but we're really trying to preserve the higher quality trees. That's what this is all about. And if they have to come down to try and either get cash or um, larger trees put back in the project. I'd be happy to answer specific the, the questions. Trying to save the higher quality trees, is, that's always been a, one of the goals here in our community, you know, where possible, right? Mayor, that's correct. So we have uh, a eight credit. If you, if you save a 20 inch oak, you're gonna get to not have to put in eight other trees that are required as part of your landscaping. And then uh, a question on uh, the coverage, if I'm a landowner in commercial only, 
I can clear cut my land down and up to 60%, is that correct? Mayor, that's correct. So a good example would be, um, I think the Scannell property and some of the other ones you've seen come in, they're gonna be cutting 60% of their trees down and they'll be doing landscaping to make up for the other trees they have to cut down. If I have a 100 year old oak in the middle of my lot, right where I wanna have a building, I cut that down, that I'm gonna to have to replace that, right? Mayor and Council, you'll have to replace it based on the number of diameter inches times the credits. So that happened for the Fairfield Inn. And they're one of the examples because that site has a major stormwater line, a major sewer line, a natural gas pipeline, and I think a power line running through it underground. There's not a lot of places to do landscaping. So they're doing landscaping in their parking lot to basically make up some of that. And they will be paying some fee depending on what you adopt um, into the tree fund to pay for that large tree that was cut along with some others on the property. Okay. Um, I have a couple more questions, but others? Um, Councilor Lehman? Um, I got a whole bunch of them actually. First, I read where it says when single family residential is a budding industrial or commercial property, good land use wouldn't, wouldn't put yourself in that position to begin with. Yeah. <clears throat> but on the second, we have some of those areas. We do. Second page, it talks about <clears throat> item D. Additional buffer yard is not required when residential uses are separated from other uses by a public street. Ordinary landscaping requirements must still be met. I think we we got to be cautious because what comes to mind is Comscope, where their driveway comes out on Shenandoah, and we specifically tried to mitigate the headlight wash right into the residential across the street. And we're, this line is telling me we're not gonna be doing that any longer. And I, and I wanna be, I want, I wanna make sure that through the development process when these issues pop up, we have a mechanism and way to address the, the light flood issue onto adjoining properties. So gonna, I'll just quickly address that. So what we would do is, so right now, you're gonna have to do a street tree every 40 feet um, and shrubbery, what we would try and do is have them do a berm if they're up against it, depending on headlight wash. We're actually looking at, we have some streets that are really wide and the right. residential is over here actually facing that way. To have the standard buffer that's in here would use up a lot of the industrial property. What we're trying to do is in that landscape space and I think doing the trees in the parking lot will help because um, the Comscope block's a really good example. We were able to get that property, actually the surface parking lot is kind of depressed there now, the, the uh, mm -hmm. MyPillow building and the SAA building. So all the employee parking is actually slightly below grade, so their headlights are hitting the landscaping. And we were able to work with that developer to get them to put all the truck traffic on the back side of that property. Right. I think the, I won't say mistake, but the issue with the Comscope building is they have trucks on the front side of the building. So they had active industrial use going on all night long. We've worked with that particular company to lessen the amount of light they're using. They had strobe lights on all their docks. They have turned those off so at night they're not disturbing the people because even though it's quite a distance, the strobe light's pretty bright. Right. So they have turned those off. More? <clears throat> the uh, next page talks about item B. Each single family lot shall have a minimum of two street trees in the boulevard. If not feasible, you basically gotta plant them in the backyard. Um, you know, I'm assuming this is for new development, but if you tried to push this on existing residential lots, it's just not feasible. Mm -hmm. Mayor and Council, this is for new development. And so what this is designed, some of the new development, particularly they're on a county road and they don't want street trees in the boulevard. So we're asking either those street trees are gonna be behind the sidewalk or we do ornamental trees because they're not as um, large so a tree. Mayor, the re our current code uh, requires two trees. Mayor, that's correct. And I think one of the issues, and we'll get more into the detail as we go through this, is right now you build a house and you're the developer. You actually put the trees typically back on the property owner. And so that becomes a fight between the builder, the city, the home buyer about who's putting the trees in. Our preference is to get those trees put in before you move in so they're actually there. The other issue we're having, and which we've really modified, is so right now, 
let's say your landscaping for a project is $100,000. We make you post cash or a revocable letter of credit for $150,000 just in case you don't do your landscaping. We make that true for the homeowner. So we're making them put up $1,500 to make sure their landscaping gets done. What we've changed in this is that we're only gonna make you do that if you come up against winter and you can't do your landscaping, or if you need your CO and then you're in the midst of doing it, but you wanna get a T TCO, you can post that letter of credit, which you'll get back once you finish the landscaping. So one of the things we've had is literally millions of dollars in landscaping escrow that we're holding on people who've done the landscaping and maybe one tree died. And so what we're trying to do is narrow it down. And that's why we've asked for the longer warranty. So instead of the city holding a letter of credit for two years, which is fairly expensive, we're basically saying, when you bid this out to a contractor, it's really on you to make sure you get a two year warranty. Okay. Mayor, it's, it specifically says R1C, which is pretty much old Shakopee, so I'm trying to figure out why would that specifically be in there when this doesn't apply to existing households. And again, we, um, that might have been, this is from the old code, happy to delete that. Uh, might have been if there were new houses, I haven't been here that long, and I don't know if there's been new houses built in old Shakopee. It could happen. Well, it could, but then, then you have the problem that I had on my property where the city took their tree down on the boulevard and didn't want to replace it, and now I, I didn't have the two-tree requirement. I had one, so I went and bought myself a tree. Yeah. And then when the city did put one in, it's a four-foot little mute that hasn't little done it. Comfy tree. <laughs> so, <laughs> so sometimes when you want government to do something for you, don't bother. You can do it better yourself. Um, more questions? Yeah, and then when we get into the parking lots becoming forest, we had this discussion at this body once before, and, and to try to run a sidewalk down the middle of a parking lot, and what's supposed to be parking, you now try to make a tree farm, and if you've got space to park the, park the trees, you should probably make the parking lot smaller. So, council member, which page are you on so I can, which diagram if you could hold well those. I'm looking at the parking lot with the trees and the uh, this one? and the yes. sidewalk going through it yep so mayor and council that's a pretty standard detail that we're actually used to photograph it's was done at the community center it's been done at most of our major shopping centers it's done throughout the Twin Cities and in fact one of the major corporations that's headquartered in Minnesota does it at every one of their projects because it gives you an opportunity to get to one spot to be able to walk safely to a building, but it also connects that walking space back to the sidewalk. So if you're on the street, you can actually walk through without having to dodge cars to get up to the main door. There's, there's more negatives to this than there is positives. And let me just give you a list of them. First, in your design sample where you got these islands that are surrounded by a curb, water can't infiltrate because it hits the curb and goes past the trees. Two, if you look at your own diagram here where the cars are parked, you go into the store and you come out with a cart, you're, you're not going to go up the sidewalk because you can't get to your trunk. And if you do, you're blocking the sidewalk with your cart and you have nowhere to put your cart. Three, if you ever sit in a parking lot and watch, people get out of the car and they go straight toward the door. They're not going to go perpendicular to the building to a sidewalk to walk up to a building. It's just not, it's not reality. Three, the maintenance side of it is a disaster. So, so council member and mayor, this is currently required in our code. All yeah, we've done terrible. is to put in a picture of one example and you'll find them every, I mean, I think if you go over to the community center and sit there, you'll see, particularly in a hockey night, it's a parade down that corridor. Mm -hmm. That is not an ideal situation because we have people crossing drive aisles, but it still works. Yeah, it's, it's, it's terrible. All we're doing is adding a whole bunch of expense to a development and then wondering, you know, we say we want development to come in and on the other side we're making it more expensive to develop. Um, I, Councilor Lamon, I, th this is the, these walkways are, are being used and people do like them. I do watch the one at, uh, at the community center and uh, it gets used quite heavily. Um, new style, big boxes are using this style too to help funnel, to help provide safety. Um, yeah, you're gonna have your cart here and you might have to walk uh, in between two cars to put your stuff in. Um, but I've seen three or four of these, they're great. And actually the company that uh, started some of this is uh, Target. 
and granted we don't have one here in town uh, but on any new development these are required um, for that I think this is changing and along with the opportunity to put landscaping in I I think it benefits the, the entire situation so I, I just I think this is the new wave of and yeah if someone's parking at a lane over there that doesn't have one of course they're not going to use it no, I, I I think the landscaping is better used on the outside of the site with a smaller park a lot you get rid of all the trees and all the islands you can make the parking lot smaller because you're taking up parking spaces with trees and curbs and well, that sidewalks would reduce our par parking requirement that would make a, a bigger space on the outside of the parking lot on the outside of the property to use these kinds of trees and buffering to mitigate light wash and sounds to the neighboring properties Council Malco? I think for me too I seeing these used but I think it's understanding that we have a snippet in time here of one section of the parking lot it's not required in each every single role it's just in those that are going to connect the sidewalk. And in the case of the community center, you have a lot of people, especially, again, on hockey night, that are parking on the street. And it's a safe way for them to walk through the parking lot and then know that they're not going to be against traffic. Councilor Whiting? You know, I think of, uh, you know, in a, in a, let's say it's a retail establishment or the community center would be a good example. When a, when a, a family comes and a lot of little kids running around, it's safer for having them funnel down a, a pathway like this that it is to have them in traffic where they're lower than your rear view mirror can see and, and uh, just seems to me that it it's a public safety issue and I think we need to maintain this in this uh, this document um, further questions on uh, walkways um, Walter Lehman no no okay you know, it's, it's one thing if you're coming from the street and walking down through a parking lot, but you just don't see that in retail establishments. If you go out here to the Target or, or at the Walmart or something like that, you're parking in these parking lots or even up at the Cub. You're parking and you're going into the store. You're not going from a street and walking all the way through the parking lot. Well, I think this is actually an opportunity to uh, defuse conflict. Because if you go to Cub or you go to any place that you know you got cars turning pulling out pulling in and then you have uh, citizens with carts and kids and they're all in the drive lane and that creates conflict and uh, um, I, I believe that these are safer I think uh, people value these um, from from what I've seen and they they're popping around up uh, all over the metro and some companies are retrofitting their parking lots to include this so it's not just new development. Council Moko? And Mayor to that point um, a lot of those spaces that are next to those those drive lanes are usually then the handicapped and the parents with small children and those types of spots then are reserved along those so it, it, it really is cuts down on a lot of that traffic through the major majority of the park. Council Lehman. Mayor I think the uh the other issue is this, the sidewalk uh, or crossings in here. It says you have to have different materials and, and stuff. Again, we're adding cost. It's it's really a striping issue. If I mean, here again, we're not living up to our own standards. Every one of our crosswalks in town, if we wanted to follow this, we'd have to put brick cobblestone or something to be different surfaces yeah. than what the road is. Mayor and Council, it says striping or, or other yeah. materials. So we, what we, we're saying is it needs and, to And I would be. use the same striping concept with the parking lot I would stripe it and crisscross it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and run it right. if you wanted to run it and and when it comes time to, to do your winter plowing you can do the whole thing without bump 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 smashing right. up trucks and tearing up curbs and mm -hmm. and you can do that um. there's uh, something else in here about the buffering between properties for a five-foot cement wall or something I think that's a serious increase in cost so, council member, that is under the uh, screening. screening section. And so, if you send the red line version, page three, and it actually gives you numerous ways you can do that. So, if you're tight on space, you could do a six foot high wall with street trees spaced 20 feet apart, or you could do shrubs like an arbavita or something at a 10 foot. For 20 feet, you can do deciduous trees, evergreen trees, and shrubs. And a berm. 
and it burns. So you're giving some choices here, depending on how much land you have available to create. Because uh, our latest example, I guess, is uh, in between High V and the apartment. Um, developer didn't have a lot of land there. What's he going to do? This offers choices for him. In Mary Council, in the past, we have allowed wooden fences. Well. And wooden, wooden fences in Minnesota are not the most durable item, and after a number of years, people either walk through them or they're not well maintained. And that's where we're giving an option. If you're really tight on space, and you can do the wall with street trees, because the street trees will give you some protection there. Or you can do shrubs, you can do a mixture of shrubs and trees, depending on how much land you can afford to use. Mm -hmm. And this also uh, kind of goes to your point on light wash, too. Uh, uh, you know, if you have that minimal space that you, uh, but, but you want to try and attack that light wash without having the space to put a berm in, uh, this would take care of it. Where did that one is? Is the, I, uh, for the, the wall is five feet or three feet? Since six Mayor and Council, the proposal is you could do a five foot minimum width with a six foot tall with street Yep. Trees every 20 feet. Six foot wall. Six, right? foot, six foot height, minimum so height. So five feet of space yep. with trees every 20 feet with a six foot high wall. That's, if you don't have any room on your site, you can do that. If you have room on your site, the other options are the... Or a couple more trees and burn them. You can do a 10 foot of shrubs, basically a hedge, or you can do a 20 foot mixture of shrubs and trees with the berm. And this goes back, we keep, high is a good, really good example. We had single family homes in an apartment building, which was fairly tall, and there was a big discussion in the neighborhood, how do you buffer that? I think right. if you give some examples, it kind of cuts that discussion well, short. And we've well, also- In between high V and the apartment, and then yeah. mainly, we want to put in a lot of protection for the, for the single family to the east and, so, and what was that going to be, a berm with some trees? So, Mayor and Council, typically you see this conflict between retail and residential that's up against it or apartment building and single-family homes. Mm -hmm. And so this is just a way to provide some guidance to try and provide that buffer between those uses. So whether it's parking in the retail, they're shining their lights, here's a solution if it's right up against the property line. Um, this example, I can tell you, my experience has been Walgreens. They tend to be on tight corners up against residential, and they'll do a wall on one side and landscaping on the other because it's someone's backyard typically in a more urban area, and so that prevents that light from getting into that person's backyard. More questions? The, uh uh, we all received an email from a developer in town. I also had a conversation with that developer in town. And um, what, from what I see, this tree ordinance or landscaping combination in our community has worked on it in the last 25 years three or four times. And always with the goal of trying to make it better. Um, and I thought we were getting better. Um, obviously, I see a lot of wins here in the penalty for cutting down trees is significantly lower. The amount of trees, I think, is going down. I'm a, the, the treeing of parking lots and trying to at least, part of it is beautification, but part of it is uh, stormwater uh, quality runoff water opportunity. Remember years ago, there were you know, rain gardens were a big thing and trying to hold that water, let it infiltrate, let it go into some soft surface before rather than just running away and, and into the storm catch. So I think there's some true benefits there. In reading the document, what, what it, it, it help me explain more what the incentives are for the developer under our new guidelines. So Mayor and Council, I think the big change is, and it struck me kind of odd too, but the bigger the building you are, the more landscaping we required. I mean, exponentially. And I think the sand company project was a really good example because I think it's three or four stories tall. 
the curve on the landscaping went up exponentially. We're now only counting that first floor, and we had this issue in industrial areas. So Amazon's a multi-level building, and so they get charged based on the square footage inside the building. Now we're just looking at the footprint. One, so that's I think that's, from a development side, that's a pretty huge savings. I think coming with a more rational, not charging um, the developer for, for trees that we would cut down. I mean, right now they're paying for every ash, willow, all those trees, they're having to pay for those. And so eliminating that's, I think, another big step in the right direction. I think we've heard through the comprehensive planning process, people want, I think we heard at the um, meeting with the tribe the other day, I mean, this was a forest at one time. So I think putting more trees back, people appreciate that. and. Even though this is Minnesota, it does get warm here, and people would like some shade in the parking lot. People would like some of that water to get absorbed. I think we're, and if you saw the example, we're actually, so 4,000 square feet of pavement now requires one tree. We're going down on that number, and I think it's going to help in the parking lots. I think it's going to help from a stormwater standpoint, and it's going to save the number of trees that developers have to use. I think the buffering will cut down a lot of the anxiety. If, if you're a resident and you know a commercial use is going to go here and an industrial use is going to go, you know there's a minimum buffering requirement. Collins for Whiting. No, I, I agree. I think you've, you know, if, if we wanted to save all the trees, we're, we're not going to build anything ever. And so I like the idea that you've made it sort of the, the footprint idea. I also like the idea that you've spelled out the species of trees and you've eliminated some of those trees that are less desirable. I wouldn't say they're not desirable, but less. Uh, the, the, the deal you've done with a letter of credit, you're actually uh, saving the developer money on their letter of credit and time, at least, for holding that And Mayor and Council, I'll tell you, when I first came here and I heard that single family homeowners, when they took their pyramid out, were paying $1,500. And I said, well, what's the $1,500 for? And they said to make sure they do their landscaping. And I said, well, if they don't, what do we do? They said, well, we keep the $1,500. So we've changed it now so that if you go through there, you give us a letter of credit for you had five trees left that you couldn't get in and they die, we're actually saying if you give us that money, you're also giving us the right to get a contractor to go in and replace those trees if you won't. Yeah. Because yeah. it defeats the whole, I mean, and Mr. Nelson can tell you, it, the amount of money that we were sitting on was mind numbing just for landscaping. And so I said, wouldn't it be better to incentivize them to get a CEO and do the landscaping now than saying, well, just write us a check, and we really can't do anything with it, but we'll hold on to your money. And the goal for, and you, and you talk about incentivizing with the, the tree replacement, I think you've created a, quite an incentive to try and save trees that are of good quality and good size, so, so that's better. Um, and, I, and as far as the plan itself, I really like the visuals. I think it will help people understand it better and work through it. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm always thinking, especially lately, uh, with the water, quality and, and, and we don't want to run off all that rainwater we want to recharge it back into the into the aquifers and into the system here that our natural system so I like the idea of the infiltration trees in the parking lots because that seems to uh, the whole idea and concept is to try and keep that from running off and taking all the sediment down river with it and I know we have retention ponds but eventually that's gonna the water is gonna end up in the river um, so I, I like the what you've done with the plan um, you know, developers would rather just be able to do what they want, and, but I think we need to have some guidelines here and work with uh, what we have, and we've improved this. I think every time we've looked at this thing, I think we've improved it. Um, so by saying that, I'll, I'll offer ordinance number 02018-003 that amends the landscape code screening and tree preservation sections to change the landscape and calculation of the tree replacements and screening. I have a motion. And I will second that. And, and I have comment. a second. And, and I would also say that in my five years almost on the council, I've seen this three times. And I think it, it started out as uber complicated, trying to get it down to what we thought was plain and simple language, but it still came back with things that needed work. And I think that for me, um, I like the diagramming. I like some of the language coming down. I'd like to see that developers are, have cost savings, you know, right out the gate. Um, and, and for me, I'm willing to, to see this through maybe a year, see how we are. I mean, if we start getting complaints again, then we, we maybe need to go back. Um, but I, I would like to see how this goes for the next year. Okay. Councilor Lehman. 
couple of points here. First is we need to clarify R1C, um, either remove it or clarify it as only new construction. New construction. We, we can do that. Uh, well, that's not what the motion is, so. Well, I can accept that as a friendly amendment. And I will second and it. Second. So I, I do also want to state that there is a chance that there is some development down in R R1C. Yeah. So and rather than eliminate the, the old district, just say new construction. It's, so it, if somebody is going to level a house and yep. build a new one, it, you know, they can put, and there's probably existing trees on a lot. It's, it's two, I understand. Yep. And but it, you never know when they re redevelop it. Yeah. Right. Okay. But if you're certainly not going to put it onto an existing house because mm -hmm. if it was my house, I'd be the first one to file a lawsuit. And, and Mayor and Council when, Member, it was, it was not our intention to do that. Right. I think it was right. for new construction. Okay, good. Second is we we got to recognize where this came from. It, it it really what really prompted this is we're trying to put too much on too small of a piece of property, and that's what we, what happens when you go into the ultra high densities. We saw it on the sand project. We, the sand project followed all of the city's guidelines and had nowhere to put their stuff. Yeah. They couldn't yeah. meet the requirements right. because we put too it much on too, too much on us yeah. on that property. And so we're trading off the the trees and, and the landscaping portion of it and slimming it all down in size, adding a lot of expense, I would argue, um, because we just want to keep packing things onto small pieces of property. That's really how I, think I see it. I this has changed that, though, with the footprint rather than the, the square footage. No, it, it doesn't, because you still have the same physical size of a property with the same physical size of development on it, and, and that's what prompted this change. They couldn't physically get what were required to put on there on there. Right. Well, something, we, we used something had to give, and what had right. to give is the landscaping and the trees. But <clears throat> let's try to go back and look at actually the ComScope site prior to before Comscope was a wooded site along a major road with residential across the street and a previous business had want to come in there and there was a lot of discussion about removing the trees yet for a buffer standpoint there there was a good stand of trees there available if to use that and instead they clear cut it and then we have to build back in the landscaping that we just talked about. Um, you're saying that if I, if I had that Comscope property that previously that was treed, that if I save some of those trees, I get some credit, right? Mayor and Council, the best example I can give you is um, Lloyd's that has a piece of property next to the former shingle recycling plant. Mm -hmm. He is preserving all those large oaks across the front and, and doing his best to make sure they stay healthy because he's not doing that much landscaping on his site because those trees are gonna block just about everything you can see on right. that site. And so he's highly motivated to save those because he wants to be able to use a lot of his site for storage and other heavy industrial things, but those trees really provide that buffer along the highway. Yep. My uh, culture layman. The ComScope issue, at least from my perspective, was, as Mr. Kursky, the mentioned the site is mm -hmm. lower yeah. so when you come out on the west driveway toward Shenandoah you're coming up and your headlights are going right into these people's houses across the street and since it's a driveway you can't put trees across their own driveway or it would oh, no yeah. longer be a driveway you yeah. wouldn't be able to get in and out so the fix there was to go across the street put evergreens in the cities right away mm -hmm. to block it from them residential I mean, what else do you do? No, I, I, there's really I get nothing that. you can do. I just wanted to, because I just, this landscaping tree ordinance has been in our community, and it just, and we come up with these different situations, and actually the two sites that we have been talking about have have been in discussion for a long time, and, um, and how do we get the right model for, uh, you know, industrial and then residential and tree or a lot that has no trees, and how do you get that landscaping back up from that? So, it's, Walter, let me you? just clarify: if we use the sand project as an example, they're better off now with this ordinance because we've changed it from from square footage to to footprint, right? 
mayor and council, between the park dedication change and the landscaping change, they're to the good of about $900,000 or more. Right. So or I think that from a landscaping side, they're <clears throat> about 50% better. I think the, the biggest change is the taller you went, the more landscaping we required. And no one no in this building or outside this building could explain the logic except the buffering issue. So the thought was I would take all those plants and surround my building with it. Well, sometimes that's not necessary, and really I'm only one, I need to buffer, because they're buffering up against a park and ride on one side. So the issue they're having is, because it was calculated on the gross square footage of the entire building, and if you look at the chart today, the number of trees and plants goes up exponentially. They also were not able to preserve um, a lot of the really big trees. I think a lot of it's gonna come down to on the more difficult sites we're seeing some more creative designs. I think and that- on that particular project, we had a lot of discussion about saving those trees and we went for a half an hour and then <coughs> it didn't happen because it couldn't happen, right. but- uh, Well, that's actually, yeah. that goes back to Councilor Lehman's point. We did have a lot of discussion about saving the trees, but then it didn't work out, but then the replacement was so uh, uh, extraordinary that it, you're right, you had no spot to plant them. Let's right. fix that. Right. So, so that's been changed. Two last comments, Mayor. One is I don't want anybody to get the impression that I'm against ComScope. I'm not. I'm just strictly using their property as an example for discussional purposes oh, only. Oh, right, right. Um, it just happened to be one that comes to mind um, because it's kind of unique and has this unique well, wa Your members point, I mean, we've learned a lot because of that project. Yep. Oh. Second point I would make is it it still doesn't make any sense to me to where you could have a 200 unit apartment paying less than single family and park dedication it would seem to me that 200 people in an apartment building are going to use the park system much more than three in a single family house but well, this we're is incentivizing stacking as much as possible into the smallest pace base as possible and then wondering why we have issues like this. I have a last question, that's Councilor Lewis or Moko. The I have a, a strong interest in the commercial industrial on a heavily wooded site. And you're saying, uh, how did we come up with the 60%? I know some communities allow up to 70% clear cut or I know of one community I think it's zero as long as you add back into the landscaping aspect. So I was just interested in that. And so Mayor and Council, the 60%, no penalty, you can cut them down. No penalty, oh, I see, okay. So if you go beyond the 60%, which you think about it, is more than 50% of a site, 60% right. is a lot of land area, that's when you start requiring replacement. Okay. And again, most of the sites in Shakopee we find 20, 30, 40% are volunteer trees. They're not the trees we really want to save. And right. so it's a pretty big credit now to basically take those out of the equation. Okay. Um, thank you. Motion and a second on the table with uh, one friendly amendment to uh, add in a new construction only uh, for R1C. the residential. R1C. 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 And with that, if there is no further discussion, uh, discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion passes four to two. Thank you all very much. Three, three, three to two. two. Three to two. Huh? Three to two. Uh, bad math. <laughs> three to two. No ma new math. Government new math. math. Government math. Fake math. I apologize. Fake math. Something like that. <laughs> Thank you. Let's move ahead to 10 a two. Uh, amend a PUD for major recreation zone. And Michael, welcome. Good to see you. Mayor and Council, um, this is a change that was a result of the Comprehensive Plan Amendment. So we told you that we were to bring back actually the zoning change. So this is um, the original language that was in the code, residential uses where it is an incidental use of no more than 20% of the total land area and is part of a plan unit development. It's now been changed where it's 40 acres at Canterbury and 20 acres at Valley Fair and must be part of a PUD. So it's very specific. There's no percentages in here. It's 40 acres and 20 acres, and it's gotta be part of a PUD. The next was to change the density. Originally, there was a minimum lot area of 10 acres. It had to be part of a PUD and more than 40 dwelling units an acre. 
It's now must be part of a PUD and no more than 28 dwelling units per acre, which matches the comp plan. So this strongly clarifies the, the three major pieces, I think, of some of this, and uh, 28 acreage and then the percentage, and as previously noted, the language uh, in the so, so Mayor, that was just language in the staff report because it is about 10%, but in the actual ordinance, it's very specific. It's 40 acres at Canterbury and 20 acres at Valley Fair. And the percentage, 10% or less, not roughly. Where's the, ten, where's the percentage in the ordinance, in the resolution? Mayor and Council, it's not, it was in the staff report because I assume someone was going to ask how we came up with 40 acres and 20 acres. Well, it's about 10% which is what was in the original ordinance. We've now just changed it to an exact number, which matches the comp plan, 40 acres at Canterbury and 20 acres at Valley Fair. Which represent 10% or less. Yes, but we're going with exact numbers. No, I, so I know. Not roughly. <laughs> not roughly. Um, questions of staff? Uh, Councilor Lehman? Well, I asked that it, the resolution specifically say 10% or less, which would be consistent with the comprehensive plan amendment. Um, and if, if it's going to be 40 and 20 acres or 21 and 43, whatever, as long as it's 10% or less. So I would, I would actually vote for this if it said this is This is some of the yeah. things that when we started this that you were very adamant about. Yep. And I like, when I saw this and I went, we're tightening this thing down, right down to the, the several points that we talked about. And um, I, I believe that 10% of Canterbury was like 40.83, something with some odd number. Well, then you shouldn't have a problem having 10% or less. We would be that. happy to, sir. All right. Other questions of staff? Other questions of staff? If not, thank you. Yes, I think Mr. Lehman needs to make this motion. Actually, I think I had, I did have another question. There was some about oh. vehicle stacking in the commercial use, and I did have another question about an existing PUD on the site. Uh, does it say six cars stacking? Where are you looking? Um, I th Council member, this language we've not touched. All we touched in this ordinance was uh, the 40 and 20 and limiting it to 28. Nothing else has been touched in the ordinance. That's the existing ordinance. That's the existing ordinance. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Because everywhere you look, and if you know, if, if we're going to have a road and commercial use with six stacking, I don't want to see it stack out onto the road. Right. So, mm -hmm. I'll have to address that in the ordinance if it's an issue. The mayor and council. I mean, the, the beauty is this is a PUD, so ultimately you all get to make the decision on yep. everything. And then the second question yeah. I had was the existing PUD on the Canterbury track site. Yes, sir. That PUD has is pretty lenient. I shouldn't say lenient. It's uh, at the time that it was created, it was um, restrictive. Well, it, it it allows you things that you normally wouldn't have a, allowed next to residential Ex uses. Accessory uses. Okay. Example: outside storage of stuff. Um, noise after 10 o'clock, excessive noise after 10 o'clock. Auto auctions. You know, you've got a lot of these things that, as we move forward here, are going to have to be addressed <coughs> in that PUD. And Mayor and Council, the intent is, so all this is doing is, in general PUDs, allowing residential as an incidental use up to either 10% or less or 40 and 20 as we get into that PUD and start amending it, that will be the time, as you see the uses come forward, that we can change that PUD. So there's a much larger PUD. You'll be seeing an amendment, for instance, for the Dorn project. You'll see an, an amendment, hopefully, for another project there. As those come through, some of those uses are going to go away. So for instance, right now, they're allowed to store new cars for a car dealer there. Well, that'll be gone, because when the road moves, that, those cars will be gone. Well, how, do we, how do we deal with, you know, rock concert at midnight next to residential five or ten years from now? Mayor and Councilman, it's a PUD, and that's something you can have ongoing <coughs> discussions and negotiations with the larger property owner. I mean, it's not in their best interest, and I'm sure they're having, they have reciprocal agreements with, for instance, the Doran Company. So 
they're not going to want to have things that hurt their ability to rent those apartments, like parking horses on the street. I mean, their PUD allows within reason just about anything. Right. Yeah. And so as we build that over, over the next five years, those uses will have to be peeled back and more refined because some of them are just going to go away. They will not be storing RVs because those sheds will all be torn down. You know, and I'm not against a lot of what they do out there no. for entertainment-wise. I think you know part of it is going to have to be scheduling and modulated. Time. You know, so that there's enough advance notice right. for people to to know what's going on. But changing the neighborhood. You know? Another discussion, I guess. All right. More uh, questions on staff? Otherwise, well, let's move forward. Mr. Lehman, you want to make a motion? No, go ahead. <laughs> Let's see if you can get my amendment in there. That's why I thought you should do it. Uh, go ahead, if you would. Add an amendment to it. I'll amend it if you make the motion. All right. Let's see here. I will offer and make a motion to adopt uh, resolution uh, or changes to the PUD of 02018-002, uh, changing the PUD text to bring it in line with the comprehensive plan amendment that was previously approved. I have a motion and Councilor I'll, Lehman. I'll second it with a friendly amendment under line 21 of the resolution which states residential uses where it is an incidental use of no more than 40 acres at Canterbury and 20 acres at Valley Fair 10% um, or less of properties part of a planned unit development. Can we, Maybe. uh, Mr. Mr. Oh, Mr. 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 Mayor, Council, I, 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 the current code says residential uses where it is an incidental use of no more than 20% of the total land area. What I understand you to say, you want to change 20 to 10. Correct. That's the amendment. Uh, total land area in the larger project that's zoned. Well, Mr. Thompson, the, the December 19th comprehensive plan amendment for this parcel specifically said 28 units 10 percent of the property so i'm all i'm doing is is making it consistent if you want i'll go back and look at that document i just read it before i came down here and you want a, this is in addition to the defined acreage this is consistent with what was passed december 19th in the conference mayor correct me if i'm wrong councilman really i think what the councilman wants to do is take out the 40 and 20 and just say it's 10 percent yeah or less or less correct okay I check with staff. That's that's okay with the, the you're planning it in this, this yes. document. Yes, I would Mr. accept. Thompson, that. we could do that. Yeah. So I, would accept that as I have a motion and a second. I have a, a second offered a friendly amendment to say ten or less percent. He agreed with that. And that's okay with the motion maker. Yeah. Still need a second. <coughs> and do we have to vote on that? We it's a friendly, it's so we don't. It's a friendly, so it's accepted by both of us, so it's yep. just a bullshit. We are good. Um, further discussion? Discussion? Discussion All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Oh. Mr. Thompson, the front page it says 10% right here. He, yeah. Mr. Kirsty said it was. That was just a gen general way of describing it. Now it's actually in the code. So. It was in the narrative and not in the res and you brought yes, that sir. up earlier. Okay. Yeah, but Mr. Thompson said it says 20% when it says 10%. Oh no, he was giving you a number. He, he just said. Current code, code. says Current, 20%. Right. We just changed it. Well, we to just 10. changed it right. to 10%. Yep. We're good. All right. More tighter. All right, let's move forward. 10A3, uh, resolution to transfer city owned property to the Economic Development Authority. Michael, welcome. Uh, uh, we talked about this <coughs> in our EDA meeting, so I'll make a motion to uh, adopt resolution number to R2018-039 to transfer property to the EDA <coughs> that was acquired in the city's name. The particular property is the small house on Scott and First Avenue that was acquired to assemble redevelopments along River Bluff. I guess we didn't talk about this specific issue. Mr. Kursky. But Mayor, it, oh, so oh wait, can, I apologize. So I have a motion and a second. Now we're going to hear from so staff. Mayor and Council, so these properties uh, were either the contracts were done in the city's name or in particular that little house was acquired in the city's name. 
we need to transfer this all over to the EDA, and in the future we'll be acquiring all property in the EDA's name. Makes um, sense, yeah. Uh, selling question, all property in the EDA. Questions state. of staff. Motion second on the table. Further discussion. We're discussion. Talking, we're talking about two pieces of property, or one. Mr. Kursky. Council, um, Mayor and Council. So what you're doing is you're actually going to transfer by quick claim deed this house here over to the EDA, and you're I transferring the, the lease and the purchase contract for the doggy dues property over to the EDA. Which house were you pointing to? The one on the corner there? We can't see your cursor. Oh, sorry. Let's try it over on this screen. Oh. It's the furthest house on the left with the garage in the rear. That's the, currently on owned the by corner the of Scott and First Avenue. Scott and First Avenue, right by Barrar. Yep. So that's currently in the city's name. We're going to quick claim that over to the, the EDA. EDA. And then you currently have a contract, uh, which is closing tomorrow, to purchase the doggy do site. Um, and if you remember, you approved a lease uh, with Doggy Beach Dues, back. but that was done in the city's name. What we're going to do is you're assigning that purchase contract and those lease rights over to the EDA. EDA. All this stuff is going to be in the EDA when we're done. Yes, sir. Yeah. This is kind of cleanup stuff in it. So, will, Mayor, will we, will we see the Doggy Do property come back for a separate action? No. You're transferring tonight the quick claiming the single family house from the city to the EDA, and you're assigning the rights for the doggy do purchase, which is in the city's name, over to the EDA. Why, don't the, why is it not listed in this resolution? It should be. I'm sorry, That's, it's at the end, I'm sorry, sir. So this one is just to, they're yeah, out of order. One in, in the this one is you're transferring, thank you, you're transferring in this resolution just the rights to the doggy use house over to the EDA. I apologize. All right, got me unconfused. I was confused. More Appreciate questions it. of staff? More questions of staff? Motion on the table and a second. No further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. 10A4, resolution to join the Met Council Livable Communities Program. Mr. Kursky. Mayor and Council, this is a short term resolution to allow some of the things the Met Council would like to see for livable communities to be incorporated into the comprehensive plan. It's just a few details, um, but also opens us up for next year to be eligible for funding out of the Livable Communities Program. Okay. Questions of staff? We have seen this before last year. Um, I actually voted against it. Um, since then, in the last year, I've done a tremendous amount of homework. Um, there are no strings attached. We do have to submit a housing plan, which we're uh, almost there on the, some of these numbers. Um, I have talked uh, in the last year to many of my peers at the Mayor's Association and Metro Cities, talked to uh, the Executive Director of the League of Minnesota Cities. Um, our taxes go to the Met Council. If we can end up getting some grants back, I do like that staff recommended a short-term thing to see how this works out. Um, you know, in the, if we can get some grant, we may have a brownfield situation, which I'm more interested in, um, that they have a, a grant for that, that we may uh, see a, a, a developer come forward that might need some help in a brownfield out on our east end. Um, and so with that um, additional knowledge, I've, uh, I've kind of changed my opinion on this. Councilor Whiting. And I hope I had something to do with that. Every time we get the little Met Council notices, I read and they, they talk about how much money they've given away in these livable communities grants. And I think the last one was, um, I'm guessing, I think it was $10 million in the Brownfield grants that they gave away. And I make sure I tell him about every time <laughs> that, that comes up. So I hope I had some help in that. But uh, I'm sure you've done your research on it. Um, to me, I think this is important uh, because there's so much grant money out there available for these Brownfield is one aspect of it, and the uh, livable communities uh, portions of it. 
There's also some other grant opportunities that as long as you're part of the correct in the process or you're in this this program, you're you're available to we we have a full time grant writer on staff. Um, that's an asset that many other cities don't have. So I think um, here's another opportunity to get her to work on some of these uh, projects that we can get some money back from the tax money we've already put in. And, and Mayor and Council, um, we have some projects that have, have not come here except for a resolution of support. They get extra points just by us being in this program. So if they're going for tax credits or other state money through the housing program, if we're participating in the program, they get extra points, so we'll help them get additional tax credits and additional money. I didn't realize that. Uh, Councilor Lehman. The more grants, the Met Council, well, let me back up and start over. You've got the city, the county, the school district, and a Met Council and the EDA. Five entities on my tax bill. So I, I get a 30 year mortgage that's non negotiable, that's good for 30 years, it doesn't change. The only people that make it go up in cost is one of these five agencies, mm -hmm. or all five combined, which is Met Council in, is included. So I'm paying the Met Council to give free my money to somebody else to make their house more affordable, which in a process makes my house more unaffordable. All their grants are not for just affordable housing. And I've heard your argument on five, and I get it, because yeah. I pay them too. Yeah. How would you like an opportunity for one of those to come back into your community? I'd like the opportunity for all five of them to lower what they're taking from me. <laughs> Thank you. But I do think that um, we do all pay into the Met Council. This is opportunity. We can do this for a while and see how it goes. This, the last time we discussed this, it, you have to have a housing action plan. Um, the numbers that they are talking about, we're already almost meeting, and I believe we'll exceed within the next year. I just, I think there's an opportunity um, to get some money back, and if this doesn't work out, then we can, we can withdraw from this. Councilor Luce. What numbers were you referring to? The, the goal plan that um, the current numbers of life cycle housing at 1368 to 2105. Um, the affordable aspect that we're almost at as well. Just one minute. Um, Michael, do you want to review those? Because I, we are very, very close as we get there. We're, we, within the next six to 12 months, I believe we'll meet them, is that correct? Correct, Mayor. So, Mayor and Council, if you remember, there was an elderly project over on 4th Street that you supported, so that will get counted into our, those buildings, will, units will be preserved. They were supposed to go back on the public market. Um, MWF is going to start construction on their project shortly. They're in for an application for the next phase of that project. You'll be seeing at the next council <coughs> meeting a project from Common Bond um, that certainly meets these criteria. And so when they talk about life cycle, they start from starter home to apartments, all of that. And we have a lot of that in the pipeline right now. So and it's not just tied to the affordable aspect. It's a, it's a housing goal plan. And um, reading your memo and looking at it, um, we are very close to in meeting it. And it's actually not a requirement. Before, when we talked, it was strings and attachments. And that's not, I, I found that's not true. Council Moko? And I think it's important to understand for the community that livable, the Livable Communities Act was actually the legislature that set that up in 1995, and it's Met Council that is actually administering it by that act. So it isn't that one or the other. It developed by Met Council and putting out there. It, it was actually developed by the, by the legislature. Um, but I, I think for many times we've seen monies um, that we could have gone for that we haven't, and I think this just helps us at least be able to get some of that money that we're paying in taxes back into this community. So with that, I will um, offer resolution number R2018-37 to join the Met Council's Livable Communities Program. Second. I have a motion and a second on the table. <clears throat> Further discussion, Culture Lehman. Once again, legislative action has done exactly the opposite of, of its intended purpose. It's made 
most houses in shack be less affordable Walter mm. Whitey um, Mr. Kursky, have, I just thought of a couple questions if you got a minute. Uh, this housing action plan, is this something we, we'd be doing already for our, for our 2040 comp plan or is this in adjacent to or completely different? It's complementary. So um, Mayor and Council, one thing is they asked in the 20, when we did in 2008 for the 2030 comp plan was how many acres are available for different types of housing. We're going to be doing that again and bring back to you a new map, a land use map, then we'll have all that acreage defined. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, they have funds available. So for instance, on the MWF project, if the certain fees were higher or um, that somehow the city would have to pay that, you can use some of their grant money to write those fees down. I want to follow up, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, we've talked about this being a short term why is this short term? Because of the 2040 planning process? Mayor and Council, correct. So they will close this out in the 2020 program for the next 10 years. And so they'll be looking at our comp plan to see we're going to incorporate kind of these overall goals that are in the Livable Communities Act into the comp plan. And so we will qualify. It's up to Council whether you want to renew it. But we will be qualified for the 2040 comp plan for the next 10 years of funding. Thank you. Uh, further discussion? 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion f passes three to two. New map. Moving ahead to 10A5, resolution to create parks, recreation, trails, and open space committee. Michael, welcome back. Steering Mayor and Council, this is an effort to, um, we heard through your work program there were lots of things you were concerned about one of the things I think we heard was long-term maintenance um, you had a lot of capital improvement projects we were looking at and I think the question was asked are we really kind of going in the right direction because we haven't had a major parks and rec plan <coughs> since 2008 and that one was based on an old model of the circles um, so Staff went out and talked to all the surrounding cities that have been doing these plans to kind of say, what are you hearing from the communities? And it was interesting, um, Adina is one that completed theirs and is now in, in the implementation phase. They didn't expect at all to get what they heard from their community. And they heard they wanted more natural landscaping, so they're actually in the process of converting their golf course over to a natural nature land park. Um, and some other cities have kind of used us as a comparable city, which after looking at it, we decided it probably wasn't necessarily a good thing. They're going to a much different park system, so much more active. It's not just fields, but it's kind of an experiential park system. So ropes courses, which kind of surprised us, are becoming very popular. More adventure playgrounds, um, really engaging people of all ages. That's the other thing we've heard from all the cities we've been talking to is that you really need to look at from the senior population down to children and it isn't just a senior center but they're much more mobile than they used to be and what are you doing for people that aren't going to play some of the sports to do in your community and so pickleball is something we've heard from a lot of the communities and so the goal would be to have a larger community that kind of represents that very broad spectrum um, to take a look at what our assets are and actually come up with a plan that can be brought back to you It'll say, here's a real capital plan for the next 10 years, and here's what it's going to cost, and here's how it's going to have to be paid for, and here's the maintenance issues we're faced today, and park by park, building by building, kind of do a life cycle analysis and see what can be torn down. And I think the, we heard in the community, somebody said, I think we do 15 or 16 skating rinks. Well, hardly many of those are used anymore. I mean, I drive through other cities, and I see them all lit up at night, and nobody's on them. Well, I asked someone who's in the skating club here, well, I can remember when I was a kid, everybody used those skating rinks, and they said, children are spoiled, they go to the indoor places now, or parents put their own skating rink in their backyards. And so they said, all these cities keep spending all this money flooding all these areas and trying to do ice, and people just aren't using it. So we need to look at what's really occurring in the marketplace, how have people changed the way they do things, and really respond to that. So if we're going to do stuff and people want it, maybe do one or two really well. Other questions? Uh, Councilor Lehman? Mayor, I thought when we had the last discussion about the parks issues, 
it was our intent that we were going to try to get this 22 percent down yeah. something reasonable yeah. and manageable and and figure out a long-term strategy of mm -hmm. locations mm -hmm. and and now it looks like we're kind of going off in a different direction here so i'm just a little bit confused on this, where we're going i think this is the the complement piece to to developing a, a plan to drive that down and find efficiencies and and look at it because right now it's just it's expanding and uh councilor Mokel? mayor i would agree with you it's about finding the efficiencies in in that maybe that 20 percent isn't what we need my question is are, are, is equity going to be part of this conversation? Because I know that um, Green Spaces, I believe, just did a huge comprehensive plan they presented to us at um, LUAC, and it talked about, um, especially like in Minneapolis, that they're finding that more, some of their diverse cultures are not looking at these huge spaces. They just really want a place to gather. So, uh, Mayor and Councilmember, that's really an interesting point. So we've talked to the seven or eight consultants that have done just about all of Minnesota. And they've all said that's one of you know we're at a 30 percent diversity population here now it's difficult to get feedback from that group so one of the things they actually have done is gone and met privately with those people and come up with what do you want and it's interesting that in the hispanic community soccer has been a huge thing and so um you're going to be seeing i think in Minneapolis and a lot of the cities more soccer and lit soccer because they play a lot of games at night. Um, cricket, there's still a pretty large population that plays cricket, which kind of surprised me. I didn't know. And they said one of the things you're going to start seeing are some cities going to be putting in cricket areas because there's a pretty big demand. It just goes back to pickleball. I mean, I didn't know what pickleball was until I started looking at all these different cities. It's a really big growing section of the market. And I think to Councilmember Lehman's point is, if you're spending 22%, are you spending it where you're getting the most bang for your buck? And are we just doing the same things we've always done and the people aren't using it and they're going, why am I paying 22% if I can't use it? And I think Eric's heard that time and time and time through the comp plan process from hundreds of people that said, look, my kids have grown, but I'd still like to do stuff in the community. The trails aren't connected. There's the kind of parks I have to get in my car and go to Maple Grove or other places to use. Why can't I have that in my community? Because if I'm paying that 22%, I really like to be able to use it. Uh, Mr. Reynolds and then Councilor Lewis. Well, uh, Mr. Kersky basically made my point, okay. Mr. Mayor. I think ultimately uh, it is, uh, Councilor Lehman, the two areas you were talking about, but it's much more. Uh, we, we really want to take a whole new look at how we're spending our tax dollars for our park system and ensuring, as Mr. Kersky said, that we're getting the bang for the buck for that. Uh, as opposed to just building stuff because it's what we've always done. Right. And may, Mayor and Council, I mean, one of the things we've heard from <coughs> people while doing this, you know, they, we've already got a lot of demographic information we're going to give them that came from the comprehensive plan, but they may come back to you and say, you need to figure out a way to do something else with these parks because nobody's going to use certain parks in the community. And one of the telltale signs was, you know, we've been installing pretty expensive gym equipment in some of the neighborhoods. And one of the residents said to me, I've got that same gym piece, except smaller from the same company, in my backyard. So he said, every day I go by and I see nobody on it, but I see people walking on the trails. Why did the city spend all that money putting that in when no one uses it? And I said, I really can't tell you, but clearly it's a good point. And I think we need to look at all the policies and things we've done. You know, There needs to be a change in some of the direction. Well, one of the uh, efficiencies I think we can find would be uh, a lot of the hockey arenas uh, during the summer that could paint in a pickleball court. That way your ball's not running away from you too far. I mean, well, still got the boards. <laughs> There's the boards. Well, I know that, you know, we just changed one rink to uh, install the turf yeah. and trying to generate uses uh, out of there. But I, I think parks of park and recreation and what we value has actually changed in the last 30 years. And uh, growing up, uh, uh, that has changed. I mean, uh, I think this will be a good look at, at how we use and what we use more effect effectively and efficient moving forward. Don't you lose? Well, and as Mr. Kursky said, you know, the, the youth are, uh, for a better word, they're spoiled. That or they're not, uh, 
durable. I mean, the cold weather, they just shy away from it so badly. It's ridiculous. So anything outside in the winter, except for the people that cross-country ski, you're pretty much eliminated. You know, Mayor I, and Council, I agree. I mean, there are certain things that we don't have in this community that I didn't even know were super, you know, they, all these firms look at 10-year trends. Mountain biking for youth is becoming a huge sport. Um, even more so than trail or road cycling and some cities are actually building mountain bike trails in some of their areas because it keeps the youth engaged they have teams schools have teams it's a whole new different way of engaging the youth because I think one of the issues is Councilmember Lou said they've gotten kind of fragile kind of soft and I think that you've got to look and see what, what do they want to do what do you can you do to get them out and get socially engaged in the community and you really have to match that there are other besides pickleball and bocce and other stuff that are older sports that are coming back in favor because the other thing that's happening in every community is people are aging in place, which didn't happen when I was growing up. People are now staying in their house till they're in their 80s and they're still active. And when they go to a park, they want to enter, have, pickleball is really about a social environment and so are some of those other less physical sports. I heard marbles might come back. Video game park. <laughs> that's what, there you go. <laughs> You know, um, the, the most played toy in Hiawatha Park over the years yeah. was the car coil spring bolted on the ground with a little thing on yeah. top that you ride and you go back and forth <laughs> on. They used it to death and it's like illegal now and they took it out, yeah. you know? So the stuff that works the best, we can't have. The old teeter totters, <laughs> etc. cetera. Councilor Luce? Well, just an example. Isn't curling just an excuse to drink? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And you can win a gold medal at it say, if you're really yeah. good at it. Those gold medals. <laughs> um, I think this is a great idea. I know we had a, a big workshop. It was part of our goal plan, and this to me would be the next step, uh, trying to look at that 22%. And and I agree with you. It's a, you had mentioned it was a companion piece to that discussion, mm -hmm. and I think we need to get the community engaged in this and, and have their input through the steering committee to. Um, not just be coming from this group, but from the community, so we get the buy-in back from it. And Mary and Council, I tell you, we brought this up at the Park and Recreation Advisory Board. They were excited. Um, we brought it up to some of the planning commissioners. I mean, I think there's people that really want to get engaged and have this discussion because they drive around and kind of go, why are we doing the same stuff we've always been doing? And right. to follow that up, I think that'd be a great spot to place this is in the Park and Rec Board and let them run with it and maybe even, uh, you know, manage that steering committee until it comes back to us. Um, I actually agree with you on that. So, uh -huh. Really? Mayor, my only concern, and, and I'll state it again, is that whatever happens in this process is following the direction of this body originally mm -hmm. and our concerns with what we wanted to accomplish. And Mayor and Council, one of the reasons why we did it this way is it didn't go to another committee. We combine all the committees we have and put them on one thing and they answer back to you. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the point, Councillor Lyman. Um, uh, you know, after, after talking about the 2018 goals, and, and this was the first time where we really had a large amount of concerns in regards to the park and recreation programs and our, and our physical uh, facilities. So uh, in, in kind of brainstorming with staff and, and, and trying to find a way to address all of these issues, as opposed to trying to hit each one of those individually, we really recognize that what this was was a, the symptoms of a larger issue, and that was having a real comprehensive look at the way we do business in park and recreations. And frankly, you're the person that started that whole conversation about two years ago. Yep. Uh, and and uh, you know that's, that's why we really wanted to take that step back that we talked about two months ago, I guess now, so we could had time to figure out how to move that forward. Uh, I'm concerned about the expenditures. 22% is a lot of money to be spending on programs and, 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 and facilities if they're not being used. Well let's, well, let's take a look and see how we can address that. It's almost double even if they are being used of what the average is in the state of Minnesota. Yeah. Okay. Culture writing, you're correct. <laughs> well, we can have some more comments after this, but I would make a motion to approve the creation of a steering committee and set its expiration date of January 1st, 2019. I have a motion and a second by Culture Mall call. Uh, Did you say first or 31st? It 31st. says no later than the second council meeting in January of 2019. That's what the resolution said. Good. 
Further discussion? 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. If I can, the, the motion's over, but uh, if staff can figure out how that, where that goes and if that's placed at Park and Rec and let us know how that's going to be. Uh, Mayor and Council, I can tell you, we'll be back to you with some of these you're going to appoint, including two council members. That my experience in the past is when you have a really big issue that affects the entire community, and especially you, having you engaged so that when you come back, you can talk about what happened at the meeting firsthand. Sure. It's pretty effective. I've done this in other cities, and by having everybody at the table and committing from now, you meet once a month, and you have a frank discussion for an hour, and it doesn't go sidetrack, they'll come back with, a, I think, a pretty powerful plan. I mean, I did this in another project, and I can tell you the one holdout group at the last meeting said, you know what, we're going to give on that item because it's really good for the community. And everyone was kind of like, wow. Because <laughs> I think <laughs> if everyone sees everyone's working together, trying to get to a common goal, it'll really help. Thank you. Uh, moving ahead then, 10A6, resolution approving assignment of purchase agreement for Doggy Doodoo's lease back to the EDA. Mayor and Council, I- Oh, welcome. <laughs> I apologize, this was the <laughs> item I thought followed the other items. So um, this is assigning the city's purchase agreement to the EDA and assigning the Doggy Doodoo <laughs> lease to the EDA. Uh, Council Whiting. I'll just state that it's Doggy Doos. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just and I'll, uh, I'll offer a motion uh, adopt resolution number R2018-041 to assign the city's purchase agreement and lease agreement to the EDA and I'll second I have a motion and a second uh, discussion 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 all in favor say aye aye, aye. those opposed motion passes Michael thank you Moving ahead then, uh, 11 reports. We had a uh, amended agenda. I guess I'm gonna call it 11A1, other business, Councilor Lehman. Mr. Mars, Mr. Mayor, sorry. I had a gentleman approach me and specifically ask me to share this item with the council. The item is apparently when you're listening to this body on TV at home, uh, I'm not sure if it's the playback or if it's live, the volume is so low that they can't hear what we're talking about, okay? So, you know, apparently they gotta turn their TVs way up to get the volume, and then if they if it goes into a commercial or it goes off for a break or whatever, it's like <laughs> blowing up the TV. So they specifically asked me to bring this up to council and talk to council and say that they would like the city to see how they can fix Apparently some of us, like me, sometimes doesn't speak into the microphone, so if you notice, I moved mine up tonight. Um, and hopefully I'll, he'll check in and tell me if it's better or not, but I do have his name, address, and phone number if you wanna pass that down to our city administrator for me, please. Um, and maybe we can have somebody take a, w a watch at something and see if how the sound is, but um, I don't know much about how it works, but it's almost like when you flip channels and you get to one channel on your TV and you can barely hear it and you crank it up so you can hear it and then you flip to a different channel, it's like, whoa, way too loud. So it's almost like our volume output isn't right. Nate? So. Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Councilor Layman, there's a couple of things I can say. The first one is to pull your mic up closer. The Done second that. thing is that um, if these little white speakers, I know it's harder for you, but I think they're all down right now, so that should have helped um, with the way that we can mess with the sound in the back okay turn up the mic volume a little bit more so it is coming through okay but then the downside is you do lose the being able to hear through these white speakers and then the third thing is we do have a quote coming to transition over to digital sound which will improve all of this stuff just by the nature of moving to like the the newer style of uh, sound management so. the one thing i noticed tonight besides moving my own microphone up and it couldn't in the past because there wasn't enough cord, but there is now. So if we have cord that we can actually move these up so that they're closer to everybody, that would help. But I noticed staff tonight standing at the podium that that microphone is about a foot short from yep. actually being up close enough. We almost need to lift that one up too then. Yeah, I, I think we actually need longer mics yeah. across the board. I, uh, uh, these, these mics were what we had in the old building. Right. Yeah. And we wanted to try, obviously, to bring what we could. Sure. But as you can see, the design of this 
thing and even the design of, of, of uh, our dais or whatever that thing's called, pedestal, yep. uh, this is the dais, uh, they're different. So uh, we tried that. I think that we probably need to, Nate's right, you know, the digital will have an effect, but we need longer mics. Right. I think uh, moving them up here, like Culture Lehman did, would help. I, my, I listen to, uh, I watch a lot of tape of council meetings, planning commissions, and I think that the sound is better than the old city hall. Room for improvement. My biggest, when I watch it on my computer, I can hear, but when I know Councilor Lucid brought that up in the past too, the, when a person stands there, they, they'd almost have to bend over to, to look into that mic and if that could, a longer staff be raised so that it's right there for them. Um, uh, tweaks, we've been in our building, what, uh, nine months, and uh, I've actually heard that the volume, the, I think the volume is slightly better. Is it great? No. Um, but I think we can improve. You know, and, and it didn't dawn on me when the, the people are talking to me about this. I'm just like, well, I can hear everybody. They're fine, <laughs> but but I'm here and they're not. Right, you know, right. um, so I don't know if there's enough cord for everybody to pull these up. If there, I think there is behind there. Um, you know, maybe that's just maybe that's the simple solution for now until later on. So I just wanted to bring it forward. They asked me specifically to bring it to council. I did. And uh, thank you for your time, everybody. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next up, City Bill, Bill List is here for our uh, review. Um, liaison reports and administration. Councilor Lehman. Uh, I have none from the last meeting, but I am going to the Capitol on the 11th for transportation stuff. That's good. That's good. You said that before. That is good. Um, I attended on March 27th the Shakopee Minnewaukan Sioux Community Intergovernmental Relations Learning Event, um, four or five hour event, um, 50 people, history, culture, language, legal history, um, building relationships. I just came away from that that I learned a lot about the, that community that I didn't know. Um, uh, I just thought it was a fantastic uh, opportunity to, we, we should never stop learning and uh, I thought it was great. Um, also, I did attend the uh, Barry Stocks retirement event, um, 30 years, former assistant city administrator, and I'm trying to find up with a city staff that can tell me what he did before he was assistant city administrator, because he said he was here for uh, 10 or 12 years and finished off a 30 year public service uh, career. So hats off to him and uh, congratulations. And that's my report. He was here prior to being an assistant city administrator right. in Shack. Yes. Right. What was he doing though? Um, and that, I didn't ask him outright. I, but, think, uh, I think it was in Park and Rec. I could be wrong though. And I was also there right. to that event. But it wasn't a, an assigned liaison, so I didn't bring it up. Huh? I said I was at Barry Stocks. Oh thing too, but I didn't bring it up on a liaison report because it's not a liaison report. Well, yeah, <clears throat> champion of, uh, of, uh, com of community and an active participant both in Shakopee and, and Savage in 30 years, uh, I, I reveled in the opportunity to, to speak to it and that's why I brought it up, but that's fine. Uh, Councilor Lehman, or Councilor Whiting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Wednesday the 28th, I had the Minnesota Valley Transit Board uh, met. Um, some of the discussion is talking about some route extensions to the Dakota County Technical uh, Center. Um, the MVTA uh, bus rodeo is coming up at the end of April, and uh, that's going to be at Gaslight Park and uh, Park and Ride in Apple Valley. The top two drivers get to go on to the state. You know, it's kind of their like the lineman rodeo, but this is bus drivers, so it might be interesting. It's an all-day event, so if you want to come out to that, that's all I have. Council Moko, thank you. I had Spuck um, last evening, and on the water side, we had um, a leak on Shakopee Avenue East, um, which was part of actually last year's recon, and they had it taken care of on Friday, and it was under warranty, but they did say it was really tough to cut into those new curb and gutters, so, mm -hmm. so they did um, have to do that. And then on the electric side, they had one outage on 327 Sunset Court. 
it was affected seven customers for 20 minutes and it was called by caused by a bird um, they also spoke about their safety training that they have ongoing and um, in regards to their rodeo they have two journeyman teams three apprentices um, going to that are training for that event um, and then they did their um, presentation on their electric side and just so you know, all of Shakopee is now 76% is underground electric. So I thought that was a good percentage. Mr. Lehman? I had a question, Mayor. When they said it was tough to cut into the curb and gutter, was that physical or emotional? I think emotional. it was emotional. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they, you could see them wincing as they were even explaining all right. it. So yeah, I think it was an emotional. And then um, they talked about some of the outages and they were saying um, five or six was, was more about the contractor's side is where they were high on there. Um, the outages were caused by contractors, and they'd like to see that number get down. Um, then they were also presented with the Certificate of Excellence and Reliability by the American Public Power Association. Wow. So I found that very interesting. They said they have not received that before. So hmm. that's all I have. Thank you, Kathy. Now, the administration report. Mr. Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Just a few things. First of all, uh, we now have turf installed in rink number two. We now have turf installed in rake number two. Uh, uh, and if you haven't had the opportunity to see it, uh, it's pretty fascinating. And there was some uh, concern from staff uh, initially about whether or not it was going to be used. Uh, you know, we, we've worked hard to uh, have our ice time to be as fully uh, rented out as possible. But uh, in talking with the rink manager, uh, he has been very happy with just what has been happening by word of mouth when it comes to that. And, and as of everything else in that building, it's state of the art, pretty amazing stuff. And I walked on it and wanted to take a nap on it. It was so nice and, and, and uh, quite, quite, the, uh, quite, the, quite the facility. Um, and that's rink number two. Please go take a look at that if you haven't had an opportunity. Ask a question about so who, people are renting it out for teams to practice things? Yeah, um, we've, uh, is it lacrosse, Nate? It was primarily lacrosse to begin with, but then we got a reasonable amount of soccer. We actually hit $21,000 in revenues booked out between the time period of March 5th when it opened until about May 10th when it'll oh, close. So wow. It's not quite what you get with ice, but it's starting to get there. We were a little concerned. You about bet. The, I was no. concerned about that. Yeah. Pretty exciting, though. That is. Uh, you know, especially on days like this, you know, we always recognize those in our police department and those in our fire department that really go above and beyond when it comes to keeping this community safe. But, you know, the public works department uh, are just doing a bang up job. Uh, they have been this whole year, uh, you know, after big storms, I like driving around to kind of see how we're doing. Uh, and I've been continuously impressed with the work that they're doing. Uh, it's been a busy uh, winter and, and recognize that that when they're when we're in bed, they're on the roads, uh, and they're they're doing their best to do uh, to clean the roads off and make it safe for everyone. So please recognize them for that. They they really are uh, doing a bang up job, and and I'm I'm been very happy with with what we've been seeing on the roadways. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'm 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 extremely pleased to announce that uh, our assistant city administrator, Nate Burkett has now received his ICMA accreditation, which essentially means that he is a, a credential manager at this point. Uh, it comes with some uh, 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 things that he's required to do. One, we have a code of ethics that we have to follow uh, that it goes in above and beyond what's required from this organization or any place that uh, credential managers work. Uh, it's, there's some uh, extended amount of uh, education that he has to do on his own uh, throughout a year period uh, uh, and then finally it's a year process or you know it has to be uh, 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 re, uh, redone every year so uh, it's the beginning of many many years in his future hopefully uh, as he continues to grow and uh, and, uh, and move things forward uh, as you know Nate has been uh, a county administrator before on a couple occasions and now uh, assistant administrator here now and now a credential ma credential manager so congratulations Nate that really is a big deal for our community uh, and I'm excited to see that 
Well, and thank you. Did you have a speech? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's that going to well, cost us? It just has it Nothing. <laughs> it's just more letters behind my name. It makes it longer to type it all out. Oh, well, congratulations. Um, if there's no other business, Councilor Luce? I just wanted to clarify one statement I made, and Mr. Kursky uh, followed up with it. Um, the kids today, according to what we believe, are soft. Our grandparents said we were soft because they used to go to school five miles through the snow, uphill, both ways. Okay. So, you know, that's just a generational thing. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. Um, if there's no other business before this council, Councilor Whiting. Just one question, Does the, is there a snowplow rodeo, Mr. <laughs> Little Hawk? Maybe we should create one, huh? No. <laughs> Just look at them big snows. Them big snows. I'll make a motion to adjourn to April 17th, 2018 at 7 p.m. Second. I have a motion and a couple seconds. <laughs> uh, further discussion? Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? We are now adjourned at 931. Congratulations. <coughs>